Good morning. Good morning, board members. Good morning. Um, I'd like to call to order the MTA's April board meeting. Uh, Paige, General Counsel Paige Grave, will you provide an update on quorum? Um, yes, Chair Lieber, we have a quorum. Thank you, Paige. Before we hear from the public speakers, we have our usual brief safety announcement. Your safety is of foremost importance to the MTA. Therefore, we ask that you listen to the following instructions. In the event of an emergency, notify emergency personnel in the room and 911 should be called. If an alarm sounds, wait for a public address announcement and follow instructions. <coughs> if told to go to another floor or to evacuate the building, leave all unessential items behind and use stairwell A just across the main hallway or stairwell D down the hallway past the elevators. An automated external defibrillator, AED, for use by trained personnel is in the main hallway just past the elevators. Thank you and have a safe day. Okay, Good morning. You. We have 21 members of the public registered to speak today. We ask that all public speakers adhere to the MTA's rules of conduct and decorum. As a reminder to the public speakers that in the interest of time and fairness to all speakers, we limit everyone to two minutes. Please be aware that there will be a warning beep to remind you that you have 30 seconds to conclude your remarks. Our first speaker today is Elliot Goldman, followed by Kara Girl. Unfortunately, I'm back again stating the same thing with um, the broker service. One minute they're coming, next minute um, the drivers um, change his mind. They don't tell me if I don't call them. I'll be out there waiting for hours. Um, last night I had a driver that told me either I listen to his music and I need to listen to his music because it's good for me or he's going to drop me off on the highway. He didn't wait till I get in the car to put my other feet up because it was so high. He just automatically asked for my number while I was entering the cab. That, that is, is so dangerous with these drivers. They say and do anything to us. And the more I come here and share my concerns, it doesn't mean anything to y'all. My life is in danger with these drivers. And they know you don't care. That's why they do what they do. Because they know they're going to be penalized. They will show some respect because a human being to a human being. My other concern is this morning I came in, thank God I got here early, and I asked you the bathroom. I was instructed to go around the corner to use the bathroom. A human being, imagine. Is this building for everybody or is it just for the elite? I'd like to know. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kara Girl, followed by Bradley Brashears. Good morning. I'm Kara Girl, Research and Communications Associate at the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA, PCAC. It's encouraging that subway ridership bounced back quickly after the horrifying attack at 36th Street. But weekday ridership has been plateauing for months since before this incident, struggling to climb past 59% of pre-pandemic ridership. It's clear that the MTA, city, and state need to come to terms with the region's new travel dynamics. Bringing the workforce back to a pre-pandemic, commuting five days a week model is slipping from reality. Like it or not, we've entered a new era where hybrid work means that many people only commute during rush hour a few days a week. Even the McKinsey best case forecast shows a long way to go before ridership comes, back, comes close to pre-pandemic levels, particularly if service continues as usual. But weekend ridership paints a completely different picture. Especially as weather has improved, weekend ridership has reached closer to 70% of pre-pandemic levels. This pattern holds true for Metro North and the Long Island Railroad as well, posing a great opportunity for the MTA to position itself as the fastest and easiest way to get around the region this summer. But if you've taken the subway on a weekend recently, which we hope you all have, you'll find overcrowded platforms and cars, unexpected service changes, and long waits on many lines. Whether they're going to spend time with friends, running errands, or going to work, people want and need to rely on transit over the weekend and overnight. Waiting 18 minutes for a train is going to drive people away rather than chew transit. Better service will help the MTA's bottom line by getting more riders on board and showing current riders that they made the right choice. By improving weekend and off-peak service, there's no doubt that weekend ridership will continue to surpass weekdays and coming closer to pre-pandemic levels. This doesn't mean we should cut weekday rush hour service, or any service for that matter. 
We're confident that you can find a way to balance complex maintenance schedules with the need for more frequent and reliable weekend service. We'll continue to fight for the operating funding necessary to make this happen. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bradley Brashears, followed by Jason Rabinowitz. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm Bradley Brashears, Planning Manager at the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA PCAC. Data enthusiasts like myself are ecstatic about the MTA Open Data Portal. Thank you, MTA, for uploading many of the data sets ahead of schedule with many more in the pipeline. You've made the commitment to continue uploading data within the three-year required time frame, developing new data sets, and revising current sets to provide more information and useful metrics for all stakeholders to use. This is extremely important for increasing transparency and trust so that everyone can collaborate on workable solutions to help improve our vast transit network. Thanks to Senator Comrie for sponsoring the legislation and Governor Hochul for signing it into law. And hats off to Sarah Meyer and the Open Data team for, for, for providing us with this useful information. Key performance indicators such as train run times, daily ridership numbers, mean distance between failure, major incidents, elevator and escalator availability, and so much more are crucial to understanding areas that are in need of improvements. Some of these data sets themselves could use some help. For example, turnstile data is currently provided in four hour segments. Breaking it down by hour would make it much more useful. In addition, passenger focused metrics, including both additional platform time and additional train time, need to be more granular. Currently, they are given as averages, which dilute the actual passenger experience. Riders do not experience averages. From previous discussions, we know you plan to improve data that is given on the current capital program dashboard. These improvements are greatly needed to provide more detailed and useful information. Some of the data points we would like to see more information about on the portal and on the dashboard itself include budget allocations and budget change information, current status of projects and reasons for delays, improved metrics for, um, improved metrics for project milestone tracking, including dates, details for projects that have no information at all, goals and purposes of projects, funding sources and cost, and 20-year need assessment data. We look forward to more information as it is made available and hope you'll continue to work with us to improve these data sets. Thank you for listening and incorporating our thoughts and ideas. Together we can make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jason Rabinowitz, followed by Lisa Daglian. Thank you, members of the board, for hearing me today. Uh, weekend service is rebounding percentage-wise faster than weekday service, and this is great. However, weekend service has become completely unreliable, slow and confusing, and the current situation is untenable. And I'm glad I'm not the only person that's here to speak about this today. Weekend service headways are truly abysmal at this point, leading to overcrowded, overcrowding situations in stations and on trains. Service is often bunched on trunk lines, for example, with trains arriving in one, two, and then 17 minutes. And entire parts or entire branches like the Astoria line are left without service in one or multiple directions for months at a time. Open the MyMTA app and you'll be greeted with a sea of changes like local to express, express to local, slow speeds, multiple changes, and more. It's a mess. It wasn't always this way, and weekend headways have gotten slowly worse and worse over the years, and service changes have gotten increasingly invasive. Just this past weekend, I was unexpectedly detoured when I realized there's no downtown local six service in Manhattan, only to be met with a 13-minute wait for any train on the 6th Avenue line or a 19-minute wait for any train on the Broadway line. This is now an all-too-common experience. Of course, I understand the need for maintenance programs to keep the system healthy and running, but the MTA has gone too far in sacrificing weakened service and must find a better balance to meet ridership demands as they change in our new reality. I urge the board to take a closer look at its night and, night and weekend maintenance program to identify efficiencies, ways to boost service on adjacent lines when service is disrupted, and anything else it can do to make service on weekends more of an appealing option for transit riders. My personal suggestion would simply to be run more trains when possible on weekends, maybe even run the B train on weekends. Too many potential transit riders are being lost to Uber and private cars because of this time-consuming hassle that reoccurs every weekend. Thank you for listening, and I hope some weekend changes can be made in the near future. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lisa Daglian, followed by Jason Anthony. Hi, good morning. I'm Lisa Daglian, Executive Director of the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA or PCAC. Today I'm going to talk about money, something near and dear to everyone's heart and critical to the MTA's future. We're incredibly fortunate to have Senator Schumer in our corner. He and the rest of the New York delegation brought home the billions, putting the MTA on reasonably stable fiscal fo footing through 2025. 
Governor Hochul also came to Rider's rescue by holding off fare increases to at least the end of this year. But tomorrow comes too soon, and we need to think about how to fill looming budget gaps today. We're committed to working with all of you, with our elected officials, the business community and good government groups, our partners in environmental justice and advocacy, and anyone who will join us to identify new sources of dedicated operating revenue. A no-brainer place to start is by plugging the giant fare evasion hole. The $500 million a year in losses would pay for more frequent and reliable service, key to getting more riders back on board. Yesterday, Jano announced a new initiative that will have as its pillars equity, education, and enforcement. Ensuring that enforcement is handled fairly will be vital to his, its success. We're pleased that panelists will include MTA board members, business, not-for-profit, and community leaders and educators. We'd also like to see a rider rep named. Using technology and investing in new fare arrays will also be welcome. We hope the city will explore changing the eligibility criteria for fair fares to the higher New York City <laughs> poverty level to expand its reach. Continued investment in signals and tracks, stations and structural improvements, and the most resilient and sustainable system possible is essential. Congestion pricing is key to making that happen. Understandably, the feds have questions. We're optimistic that your answers will satisfy them and prompt your urgent reply and prompt you, you and encourage your prompt reply. This week we heard that funds will first be realized in 2024. We hope that process can be accelerated. It's too important to Thank be, you for your be a comments. political football again, and we'll keep our eyes sharply on that prize. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jason Anthony, followed by Charlton Tasusa. Good morning, MTA board. Jason Anthony from Amazon Labor Union, the first independent worker-led union in the entire United States of America established in New York City. This month, I'm talking about safety. Once again, a person got shot, but unfortunately killed inside our subway system. This time occurred at Jamaica Center, where the NYPD, this time in Transit District 20, where police is never there. Who is to blame here? It's not obviously Jason Wilcox. Captain O'Reilly. When Kathy O'Reilly was in charge of transit, she never came to the MTA board meetings like every single transit head supposed to do. Where is the police commissioner, Kishan Sewell? She's never showed up to every single MTA board meeting like every single citizen is doing. I ride the subway every day to Amazon in Staten Island. My commute starts where everybody else is sleeping. I oftentimes feel scared for my coworkers who have to use the train around the same time like me to go to Staten Island from different parts of the city. So Jano, we need more police officers, not only in train stations, but also aboard trains. So I could be in that uh, panel that you guys want to establish. Thank you for your comment. So call me on this. I'll see you guys next month. Our next speaker is Charlton Tasusa, followed by Rachel Foss. Charlton? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Charlton D'Souza. I'm the uh, president of Passengers United. And yet again, another person has been killed in the New York City subway. And what I want to know is if the chiefs and all the police officers are being there with their supervisors and they're riding the system, why are the chiefs and police officers still playing with their phones? This is an all-out crisis. And no one, there's no accountability. No one's being held accountable. It's just a mess underground. And then you guys try to distract the media with this whole fair evasion thing. So now, you know what? Why don't you guys open all the station boats and allow the station agents 
to start making cash transactions. Because you know what's going to happen now? You know, if someone, let's say if their Metro card stops working or if the vending machines have been vandalized, those people are going to get arrested and put in jail. So at the same time, yes, we want fair beaters who are just jumping the turnstile for the fun of it to be arrested. But if their Metro card stops working, that's not their fault. That's the MT's fault. You guys need to fix your vending machines. And also, what I want to know is, what is the safety director, Patrick Warren, doing? You know, it's time for Patrick Warren, unfortunately. I feel like the chairman, you need to make leadership changes at the MTA because the MTA inspector general is now investigating the cameras. But what took so long? We've all known for so many years that the cameras in the subway system were not working. And, you know, this incident at Parsons Archer where there were no police officers on the platform at the time of the shooting is deeply disturbing. So I want an investigation into the MT police deployments at that station. There's a lot of waste, a lot of mismanagement going on, and you guys keep playing games at every board meeting. We're not getting answers. The public deserves better. Our next speaker is Rachel Foss, followed by Giancarlo Padula. Good morning. Uh, my name is Rachel Foss, the Senior Research Analyst for reInvent Albany. We advocate for more transparent and accountable government, including for authorities like the MTA. We are glad to see the MTA publish its open data plan, including a data catalog and a an accompanying schedule, the first major milestone under the new open data law. We recommend that the catalog be published on the state's open portal, not just the MTA's website, and it should also include all data sets published on the portal. Since the law was signed by Governor Hochul in October 2021, the MTA has grown the number of data sets on the open data portal from 76 to 118. Additionally, 41 data sets, more, more data sets will be added to the portal by the end of 2023. This will more than double the amount of data available on the portal, an important achievement. Quantity is important, but also quality. Crucial data on the catalog includes ridership data. The MTA will publish historic and projected ridership data, as well as daily ridership compared to pre-COVID levels. The MTA will publish MetroCard and Omni usage data and accompanying data for the commuter railroads and buses, I'm sorry, occupancy data, which reflect crowding rates. On capital program data, the MTA plans enhancements to capital dashboard data and will publish open data for its 20-year needs assessment in 2023. We ask the MTA to meet with advocates about these enhancements and ensure that the dashboard data includes contract numbers and vendors and codes as accessibility and resiliency projects separately. On service data, the MTA will add current service data and alerts to its open data portal and will newly include end-to-end -end running times for the subways and buses. We ask that this be expanded to the commuter railroads. Lastly, financial and workforce data. The MTA will add data related to the operating budget, debt outstanding, fare box recovery, as well as overtime diversity and other workforce and staffing data. We encourage the MTA to expand this to include all data in the financial plans and board books. We thank the MTA staff for their efforts so far and encourage that you plan to automate release of the data, which will make this a more sustainable effort. And it's also important that you view this as a living thank document you for your comment. subject to additional feedback. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Giancarlo Padula, followed by Miriam Fisher. This way? Gotcha. Thank you. All right. You guys can hear me? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Padula, and I'm a supervisor with Educational Vision Services from the Department of Education. We are the District 75 program responsible for providing services to our city's blind and low vision students. I want to start this morning by um, saying congratulations to Jano on your appointment. Jano, things feel a lot more collaborative ever since uh, you've taken the helm, so thank you for that. I also want to thank Craig Cipriano for his work as president. Craig, congratulations on your new position. I've always enjoyed working with you and hope to get to do so going forward. A big welcome to Chris Pangolinen. Hope I didn't mess that up. Um, I'm so glad to see the VP of Accessoride position filled, and I'm glad to hear that now that will be reporting directly to the president. Chris, I've been listening to you speak about Accessoride over the last few weeks, and it's been music to my ears. I'd be remiss if I didn't give Don Ramondi a big shout out, who's been holding things down over some crazy, crazy times, and him and the team have been doing a good job in spite of all the craziness. 
Gentlemen, we've made some progress with Accessoride over the last few years, um, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Transportation still remains a major barrier to employment for the disabled community. Accessoride has to evolve into a viable option, affording disabled citizens the same rights, autonomy, and access to opportunity as every other citizen in this city. On-demand service not only allows me, enables me to perform my job as an itinerant supervisor over multiple boroughs, but it allows me to live my life with the same autonomy and dignity as any other taxpaying citizen. So let's work together, let's reimagine Accessoride, make it a viable solution for those of us that need it. Never mistake disability for inability, and please remember, low expectations do lead to low outcomes. Thank you very much. See you guys next month. God bless. Our next speaker is Miriam Fisher, followed by Janae Moret. Good morning. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Uh, I want to welcome the new um, Richard Davey. I don't know if he's present today, but hopefully you will hear this, uh, president of the New York City Transit. I'd like to quote his predecessor, Andy Byford, accessibility is a moral imperative and requests binding legal commitment to the 75% of our subway stations, which are still unaccessible, no elevator, no ramps for purple with disabilities, parents with strollers, bad backs, knees, luggage, a uh, reminder of Malaysia Goodson, a 22-year-old mother who died at 7th Avenue Station holding her baby and stroller because of steep steps. Uh, second, uh, empty seats on the MTA board and traffic mobility board with no one with a disability and experience using public transit uh, on the subway. Uh, the Governor and mayor um, have the opportunity to add and appoint people with disabilities. Thirdly, and often I'm the only one mentioning light rail for uh, the possibility of the Second Avenue subway extension, which uh, which is quicker, cheaper, accessible, emergency exit. How much will be siphoned off? from uh, accessibility for people who don't have other options, extended past the 125th Street Transit Desert in the underserved Bronx, which was one of the original plans of the Second Avenue subway. There are models in Europe and our neighbor in New Jersey with light rail in, in the towns along the Hudson. Uh, this is something that could still be explored and would be faster, cheaper. Uh, the Second Avenue subway has been called the most. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Janae Moret, followed by Michael Ring. Good morning, MCA board members and constituents. I as an employee of New York City Transit, we are held at the highest regard to uphold MTA rules and regulations. And if we fail to do so, we are penalized. But what happens when the MT employer, MTA, fails to uphold a safe and clean work environment for their employees? Who can the employees penalize? How can MTA ensure to our families that we will return home safely after a day's work? Why is it that Rules applies to all employees, but it does not apply to everyone who uses the system. When we call for police response, it may take up to an hour or sometimes not at all. An employee who is constantly under scrutiny and threats for wearing this uniform because we have these three letters on it. Our, our authority is laughed at by the public when we are enforcing the rules to deter fear evasion. Our mental health is diminished when we are verbally and physically attacked. How are employees supposed to provide cu courteous customer service when we are, when our morale is down and complaints are up? We are not seen as men and women who uses, who who keeps this transportation system running. We are looked at merely peasants and ingrates. We come to work daily to ensure a safe and, safe and courteous customer service to provide service to our communities. Just like our customers are owed the utmost respect, MTA owes us gratitude. 
Our next speaker is Michael Ring, followed by Alita Dupree. Hi, uh, a short visual description for those who need it. I'm, a, I'm just a white guy wearing a green hat and hoodie that's a uh, disabled in action on it, the organization I represent. Um, I'd like to hope everyone here and the board and the audience is having a good day. I'm having a good day because I was able to walk out of my house and walk down the stairs at Grand Army Plaza, to get on the train, change at Nevin Street, get off here at Bowling Green, and I was able to get into this room. Um, for most, I was on the train and I shared my ride with so many New Yorkers, New Yorkers who were going to work or going to school, um, not going to an appointment. Um, people who use Accessoride are always talking about their appointments, um, not going to work. Um, we, people need to go to work and Accessoride doesn't work for people who have to go to work. You have to budget in 60 to 90 minutes or even two hours in each direction you have to plan a day in advance. That doesn't work if you go to work. Um, imagine, you know, we're up here on the 20th story. Imagine if there was just one elevator and you had to make an appointment a day in advance as to when you wanted to use the elevator. You wouldn't be here. No one would do that. Um, and also imagine if your appointment wouldn't be honored or the person operating the elevator was um, rude to you. No one would go to work. You guys, so many New Yorkers with disability are leading isolated, um, unproductive lives because they can't get to work. So if there's anything you can do to hurry up the accessibility in the subway stations so everyone can get to work with, with dignity and efficiently, I would just urge you to do that because um, there's people who want to go out and make money and pay taxes. And many of them have disabilities and, and, and want to go to work and don't want to have to plan two, four hours for their whole day to travel in an accessory ride in an unsustainable traffic causing thing. Thanks. Hi, Alfie. Thank Hi. you for your comment. Can you talk? Uh, yeah. Our next. Um, all right. Did you get the email that I sent? Uh, when it, I didn't Our next speaker is Alita Dupree, followed by Andy Quill. Um, thank you again. Uh, Chair General Lieber and members, Alita Dupree for the record, my pronouns are she and her. It's always good to be with you again. I hope to make it to New York next month. And um, I'm looking forward to the Omni data. And while I haven't been to New York, I'm thinking about things I'm learning in California. I went to two Passover seders, one in Los Angeles, one in Oakland. And I, I, I didn't get to speak at the committee meetings on Monday because I was flying on planes on airplane. I'm afraid of flying on airplanes. I've flown 23 times in the last year, so I'm doing okay. Um, so accessibility is really important because I was in San Francisco with a friend who used an electric wheelchair, and I took the time to ride with him uh, in the BART elevators, and it's not easy. I really got to see what it's like to a point, uh, seeing my friend go through this every day. So uh, we got to work on building more accessible stations uh, so that my friend, when he comes to New York, can enjoy the subway more fully. And, um, you know, I was thinking about the diesel trains last month. And I heard, I read a press release and heard a podcast that there's this railroad in Los Angeles called Metrolink. It's actually geographically quite large. And they're running on 100% renewable diesel. I'm thinking... Why aren't we doing that here? I think we can do that here. We can't do it tomorrow, but I think we can do it here. And I also rode on a, a bus service in L.A., and there's lots of buses in L.A., not as many as New York, but L.A. buses everywhere. And this little bus service doesn't take cash in the fare box. It works. So we shouldn't be having the money floating around on the system. We can get people involved in Omni and be able to load money up in their community. I bring you some positive energy. And just remember, the system is Thank you for your an comment. institution that is legendary. Our next speaker is Andy Quito, followed by Michael Howard. Andy Quito.
Andy? Uh, hello, you guys can hear me? Yes, we can. You can begin. Okay, good Good morning, MTA board. My name is Andy Quito, and I'm a resident of, of Jamaica, Queens, um, New York. So guess what? Once again, another fatal shooting, and this time at, at my home station, Jamaica Center Parsons Archer. I'll be speaking to people like Andrew Albert, Daniel Lever, and everybody at the MTA about that station. That station is a death trap right now. People are selling drugs. In the open, selling swipes, there's homeless around, there's gang activity around. I have addressed this. Many other writers have addressed this. We brought it up to local elected officials. Nothing gets done about it. This shooting now it now exposes the real danger of that station specifically. Every single day. They don't care. You guys in the MTA, the city of New York, the state of New York, you guys don't care about that station. It, it's not, this crime's at an all-time high on the subway. And, and, and then you got people like Jan Lever. Saying, uh, uh, saying his BS about about all oh, the, the we need to crack on fair invasion. Newsflash: the guy that that, that shot off the the, the 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 train at Sunset Park did pay his fare. In the in the in the in the in the person that shot the person at Parsons of Archer, these people don't even pay the fare because they always hanging around at the main scene. They never go into the system. So that that's that's just not going to help. What we need is proactive policing. We need back. We need to bring back broken windows. Have cops ride on the train from from one end to the other, you know. That's all. That's all we asking for. But you guys don't care, and we're gonna keep advocating for more policing because you guys really don't care about 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 our safety on the subway. If you, if you don't want to do it, get off the board, and, and and please, just you guys should be ashamed of yourself. That's all I gotta say. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Our next speaker is Michael Howard, followed by C N. <clears throat> Morning. My name is Michael Howard. I prefer Mike. Um, let me um give me give y'all a, a short description about me. I have a mild intellectual disability. Mild intellectual learning disability. Um, I just want to say this. Um, for the last eight, almost eight years. At Far Rockway, my Avenue station, I never see no change. I send y'all an email about the sign, not just the e yeah. I send the email with the picture that needs that sign needs to be changed that says take out Q22A and replace it as Q114. You know what I mean? And speaking of the A line, I am sick and tired of seeing. Dirty cars on the outside. I know I see I see maintenance people clean up on the inside, but the outside has to be clean on every almost every equipment. No matter if it's R46 or R179. Both of those equipment that runs on that line, that runs on that line needs to be clean on the outside, not just the inside. You feel me? And I am sick. I am so anti R46. I, I, send, I, I remember I sent an email last month about the heating system. Let me tell you something. The heating system has failed on the R46. But the heating system did not fail on the R179. I always feel the heat on that on R R one seventy nine more than I feel the heat on the R forty six. Every winter that happens. Thank happen. you for your comment. Thank you very much. I'll see y'all. See some of y'all tomorrow. Our next speaker is Andy Pollock, followed by Cecilia. Or sorry, our next speaker is C N, followed by Andy Pollock.
Good morning. Uh, today I'm going to speak about the strollers in the handicap area of the buses. I did some research and I haven't found one article or case where a baby has slipped out the hands of its mother on an MTA bus. So I'm pleased to declare that MTA buses are extremely safe. They also travel, according to the MTA data at a speed of eight miles per hour. That's the average speed, which is extremely slow. So I highly doubt that if a bus was gonna slam on its brakes, I doubt that um, someone's gonna drop their baby. And uh, I'd like to add that, you know, on airplanes, which travel a lot faster than an MTA bus when it takes off from the runway into the sky and sometimes encounters turbulence and then travels extremely fast when it lands back onto the runway, why is it that mothers are able to hold on to their babies without the baby flying through the cabin? That's what I would like to know. So, you know, I think it's absolute rubbish that there is some sort of danger of their baby slipping out their hands. I think it's looking for a solution to an imaginary problem. You know, there's a lot of brave women out there who uh, are in the army and the uh, armed forces, who are first responders, nurses, cops, firefighters, you name it, women can do many amazing things. And I'm sure that they're able to hold on to their baby uh, when they are on the bus. And, you know, some of them say, well, you know, we just want to share the space that disabled people are, uh, you know, when they're not occupying that space. Well, why aren't you letting transgender women share the female bathroom? Because a lot of you guys are, uh, are you know, against that for trans uh, transgender women to share the female bathroom. So I don't understand the double standard right there. So um, I'd like to end with this, which is basically today they're after, you know, um, the handicapped area of the buses. Tomorrow they'll be after the handicapped car park spaces in the parking lots. So, you know, uh, please, this is a terrible idea. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Andy Pollock, followed by Cecilia Ellis. Good Andy. morning, Chairman Lieber. Good morning, members of the board, and good morning, Lucille. So, fair evasion is going to be the main topic at hand today. Now, obviously, I know the chairman was bringing it up yesterday at a press event, and obviously, bottom line is, fair evasion is one of the many problems that is facing our transit system, bus-wise and subway-wise. And I've noticed that uh, in my years of taking New York City transit, but bottom line is what happened at Sunset Park two weeks ago, the suspect paid his fare in Sunset Park. So there's obviously more issues that need to be combative when it comes to the crime wave that we are dealing with. But the bottom line is, you know, time to start taking this seriously. We've been saying this for a while and um, I hope most of you were listening to 1010 Wins this morning because the mayor made a very valid point. You know, we always have our creed here in the city, see something, say something. And if you see a transit cop playing with his or her cell phone, you know, the mayor's on Twitter, the mayor's on Instagram, notify him. Because you can't, if you're a transit cop and you're listening to this, stop loudly gagging, start arresting you see something going on, you see people jumping the turnstile, you see people, you know, doing something out of the ordinary, confront the problem. Stop playing with your cell phone. And please, as I just said, if you see some cop playing with their phone, notify the mayor on social media. So I'm going to conclude my comments, Lucille, because I have my timer in front of me. So thank you very much. I'll be speaking at the Queens Bus Redesign meetings next month. So take care, everyone. Our next speaker is Cecilia Ellis, followed by Jean Ryan. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Cecilia Ellis. I'm the campaign coordinator for the Nye Park Strap Hangers campaign, um, but I am reading a testimony on behalf of one of our students, Kelly Rivera, a student at City College and a project leader for the Nye Park Strap Hangers campaign. Uh, this year has been very difficult for everyone. The pandemic shifted our mode of thinking and the way in which we live. We still continue to adapt in these times. Nonetheless, our transportation should not be a mode of concern. Over the last two months, college student bus riders have joined together to advocate for better buses. Students, transit advocates, and city council members delivered to City Hall over 1,200 letters and stories endorsing the student bus rider platform. 
That's over 1,200 students who want all door boarding and permanent Omni fare capping. Fare capping would be a great way to extend unlimited Metro cards um, through Omni to all New Yorkers. It's an affordable option and convenient for most New Yorkers. I often find myself arriving late despite leaving early due to the traffic on buses. And sometimes they don't even come for 20 minutes and then suddenly I see three buses on the same line arrive all at the same time. All door boarding is a great way to speed up bus service and avoid delays for a commuter route. Rather than making everyone in line waiting to go in, it would just be quick and efficient along the already, imp the already implemented Omni tap at the back doors on the buses. It'd be very easy to turn on the back door Omni readers up onboarding and offloading all along the route. This is an issue of equity, making paying the fare quick and easy and discounts available to everyone permanently and speeding up bus service for all riders. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jean Ryan, followed by Edwin Herrero. <clears throat> Hello. I'm Jean Ryan, President of Disabled in Action of Metropolitan New York. Many years ago, I gave a report to Accessride on the use of taxis for paratransit in other cities, especially Chicago, and I urged Accessride to use taxis too. I think they were thinking, what do taxis have to do with us? Now, 75% of Accessride registrants are taking taxis or for hire vehicles. But as I said on Monday's committee meeting, there's a lot of prejudice, discrimination, and ignorance of wheelchair users from drivers and dispatchers and app companies. They don't want to drive waves or pick us up. They don't know how to or want to secure us and our wheelchairs. Not all drivers, of course, but they know we can only ride in waves. Much racial discrimination has been eliminated by apps. You can't see color on an app but we have to advertise our status <clears throat> by re requesting a wave. Now, years later, I am asking the MTA and everyone listening to me to work towards full accessibility of taxis and for hire vehicles. So wheelchair users will no longer have to point out that we need a wave because everyone can use wheelchair accessible vehicles. Thank you. Our next speaker is Edwin Hero, followed by Lourdes de la Cruz. How do I do that? Oh, man. Edwin? Um, yes. For, for, um, thank you, MTA. Um, on Monday, I was celebrating 34 years for, um, I, uh, on Monday, I was 34 years is my birthday on Monday. First of all, I have three things to say um, about the, it happened in a couple weeks ago. And there was an incident uh, in the train at 36th Street and I was surprised that no one got killed over there. Um, I want to re um, let you know that we need to revise the background checks on the uh, track workers and 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 the um, track workers and um, police officers. Um, and second of all, Jason and Anthony don't blame on MTA. And third. Um, Craig said piano, we will miss you. That is in the last days of the MTA board meeting. Thank you. I'll, uh, thank you, everyone. Bye. Our last speaker is Lourdes de la Cruz. Good morning. There has been countless outcries for assistance in, re in regulating our safety. Due to the history of the unsafe conditions continuously plaguing the potential risk, 
continually displaying the potential risk for detrimental events to occur, you are all undeniably aware. It has plagued the system for decades. Everyone is vulnerable to grievous bodily harm due to blatant negligence. Considering the severity, there has not been any drastic or adequate changes demonstrating that these concerns have been acknowledged and rendered as emergencies. We've openly verbalized deadly concerns to the extent of being murdered. We're struggling with exercising our duties to our duties due to being in the constant state of fight or flight every second of the hour. It is public knowledge that perpetrators use us as punching bags to express displaced anger towards New York City Transit. We are plagued with vagrants attacking people, and let's not forget the gun violence. The evident lack of effective safety precautions is disturbing. Innocent people are suffering due to your negligence in rectifying the unmanageable criminal activities. The chaos creates innumerable liabilities. So where is the solution? Where is the concern for the babies and innocent children riding the subways? Some ride the trains daily and alone. The ineffective safety protocols and surveillance system shows the drastic need to counteract the negligence, or we will remain at risk for deadly harm. How many more decades of casualties and acts of violence must occur? You receive sufficient funding, so why isn't it appropriately allocated towards ensuring everyone's safety? Those fancy designs plastered on these screens every month displaying your multi-million dollar projects shows that you are highly capable of designing effective safety measures. Everyone's safety is worth the dollar amount and effort efforts poured into these fancy projects, if not more. You have the power to remedy these matters. Being complacent and disregarding the urgency leaves you with decades old blood on your hands. You may not physically hold the weapons, but you prolong the failure. You prolong the failures in implementing the effective solutions, which leaves you all who have heard us, our countless crimes to appear as if you have been excessively negligent by choice. You are perpetrating these conditions by depriving us of expedient solutions just and making you just as complicit as the perpetrators. There is no excuse Thank and the urgency is comment. explicitly obvious. Thank you. Chair Lieber, that concludes public comment. Thank you, Lucille, and thank you to all the folks who uh, gave public comments. Um, before we move to regular board business, I, I want to make a motion to convene an executive session to discuss labor matters pursuant to Section 1051E of the New York State Public Officers Law. May I have a second? I move. Uh, all in favor? Any opposition? We're in executive session.
Okay. Uh, let, let's resume. The board is voted to uh, resume public session. Uh, Neil's Capital Program Committee is going to vote. No. 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 Okay. Okay. Um, while in executive session, the board discussed and voted on two labor agreements between MTA and various labor unions. Uh, so that, that business is concluded. Uh, now we're going to hear from board member Zuckerman, who will de deliver the capital program report. Neil. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The capital program committee met on Monday and reports the following. There are five competitive procurement actions for a total of $62.4 million. This committee recommends these items, and I move them. May I have a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition or abstention? Thank you. The items carry. Um, today we're going to hear from uh, – I want to – we had a vote on C and D items. All right. Yeah, I understand the next okay. Are there other? We needed to do that. I, I apologize. We need to do that because to make sure that we had a quorum for all the elements of this. We'll do finance I think we're going to uh, we're going to shift to somebody. Help me here. Finance. Uh, where is the finance committee in this? Why don't we um, shift to ten? Okay, Mr. Zuckerman again will deliver the finance committee report. Thank you, sir. And uh, Page eight. I'm looking forward in my hymnal. You give me one Page. second. Oh, thank you, sir. I got it. Leave it for the guy from the Naval Academy to beat the guy from the Air, the, what, the United States Military Academy. Okay, sir. The Finance Committee met on Monday and reports the following. There are two action items this month. The first item seeks board approval to issue revenue anticipation notes, and the second action seeks board approval to authorize corrections to the MRT two escalator payments to the counties of Dutchess, Orange, and Rockland. The committee recommends these two actions, and I move them. Second. Any uh, opposition or abstentions? The motion carries. There are five real estate action items this month described on pages 66 through 77 of the board book. The committee recommends these items uh, to include city winery entering into Grand Central Terminal, which I am personally very excited about, and I move them. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposition or abstentions? The motions carry. This concludes the Finance Committee report, Mr. Chair. Okay. Sorry? Joint Railroad Committee, Mr. Fleischer, would you do the honors? On Monday, the Joint uh, Long Island Railroad and Metro North Committees uh, met, and I report the following. There is one item this month requesting board approval of a ratification agreement in the amount of $15 million. Uh, committee quorum was not present, however, and the committee recommends this item to the full, vo full board for a vote. I move this item. Yes, the, the materials were in the book. Is May I have a second in Mr. Fleischer's motion? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposition or abstention? Thank you. The item carries. New York City Transit Committee meeting. Mr. Chair, the New York City Transit Committee met on Monday and reports the following. There's one competitive item for $37 million. The committee recommends this item, and I move it. May I have a second? All in favor? Any opposition or abstention? The item carries. I believe that concludes committee reports. B and T committee, Ms. Barbas. Chair, there are no items to report. Thank you, Ms. Barbas. And last but not least, the minutes of the March Moore meeting and, and minutes from each of the committees have been distributed to all members. Are there any corrections or omissions? Okay. If there are no further corrections, the minutes are approved as distributed. Okay. Having completed that round of business, I'm going to do a, a board update right now. Thank you. Um, okay. Everybody, especially our, our public speakers and uh, members of the public who are watching this remotely, thank you for joining this month's meeting of the MTA board. Uh, I know that transit safety is, is at the top of everybody's minds this month. The shooting two weeks ago at 36th Street and Sunset Park was horrific. It's a deeply frightening moment for all New Yorkers, in part because it came on top of several months of increasing crime in the subway, 
and in our transit system that have left many of our customers feeling fundamentally unsafe. I want to acknowledge the heroism that we saw on that tragic day, April 12th. From the people on the platforms who helped to triage the victims at risk to themselves, the brave, brave MTA workers who acted quickly to save lives and get people out of harm's way, to the dogged investigators of the, MT of the NYPD and the alert public tipsters who helped bring the suspect to justice. I want to thank all of them for their actions today, especially our MTA colleagues who are not only frontline heroes on that day, but during COVID when they carried the city on their backs to help us survive the pandemic and every day when they respond to emergencies like this shooting, but everyday emergencies of all kinds. It's an honor to be welcoming Governor Kathy Hochul later to this board meeting so we can have her join us to commend 18 NY and New York City Transit employees who acted heroically on April 12th. This is the first time that a sitting governor has personally attended an MTA board meeting, which is indicative of the governor's tremendous commitment to our mission. Of course, the shooting, as horrific as it was, is only one of many high profile and some lower profile crimes that have our customers feeling unsafe these days or just uncomfortable in the system. The trends are worrisome. Total major felonies in March increased by 52 percent compared to the same month in 2021. And for the year so far, January to March, they're up by almost 70 percent. Our riders know this. They hear about it from local news every day. Our customers' decreasing sense of safety and security may be contributing to the plateauing numbers that we're seeing in terms of weekday subway ridership, which was going up steadily before Omicron, but has, as we say, plateaued uh, in the months since. Um, and it's also confirmed, this, this widespread concern is reflected also in surveys that have been done by the business community, the New York City Partnership, which is hearing the same thing from its members. I also want to acknowledge that part of the unease is not just our customers, but our workforce. And we heard from a couple speakers today who talked about transit workers' sense of lack of safety. There's also statistics demonstrating that att attacks on transit workers are up. And that's why we are appealing to the legislature again to rationalize the law that affects attacks on transit workers. It shouldn't be only some transit workers who attacks on which are actually crimes. Violent attacks on some transit workers are, are treated like it's a fair evasion violation. That doesn't work. It's time to address that and to make all the transit workers who work for all of us equally protected in the subway system and in our transit system at large. The other thing that our riders is telling us in surveys and other channels is that what makes them feel safe is to see cops on the subway, to see cops on platforms in particular and on trains. The mayor, God bless him, has talked about this passionately even in the last 24 hours. Riders want to see police where they're feeling vulnerable. And I am so thrilled that the mayor has specifically committed to move transit bureau of police onto trains and platforms. It's something that this board has been asking for for some time, well before the mayor took over City Hall. It is really a step forward, uh, and our riders, I hope, will start to feel the difference. You heard Chief Wilcox report on Monday that uniformed train patrols were up 34 percent, helped by a surge of officers um, and the presence of precinct patrol officers who are coming down from topside into the system and inspecting station safety. Our own data, this is important, our own data backs up 
what the police department is saying, that, that, that more, there are more police in the system of late. We had half a million swipes by police officers in all of 2021. Remember, we give special uh, metro cards to police officers so they can swipe in freely. In just three months, in the first three months of 2022, we've already hit that same half a million number. So the, the, the surge of police into the system, I believe, is real, and it's validated by data that we have, as well as by our partners at the NYPD. But safety isn't only about major crime stats. Obviously, that is always going to be the first thing that people talk about, and, and rightfully so. But when — but it, there are quality — what people call quality of life issues are also real to what our riders are feeling. When we — when riders see people breaking the rules, smoking, public urination, open drug use, vandalism, they wonder, what would that person — what else might that person do? What might that person do to me? I'm a customer, and I feel this when I ride. It's unnerving to be in a subway car with somebody who is breaking — you know, who's blatantly breaking the rules. Um, and whether it's — whichever of those violations it is, uh, we, we have to deal with the reality. That's why I'm showing on the screen that we are tracking these specific quality of life violations. Shopping carts, the, the, the arson of shopping carts has actually put, in several cases, put — had killed one of our train operators. It's put countless MTA employees and passengers at risk. Um, so we are looking carefully at the data, and interestingly, we are also starting to focus on how do we get information from the public and communicate it to people who can intervene, NYPD and otherwise, quickly so action can be taken. So we've been encouraging folks, and that's one of the graphs you're seeing on the screen, to communicate these kinds of rule breaking through 311. Our customer service team worked out with 311 how that data can be included and acted upon. And we're communicating it to the NYPD, so hopefully — and this is a process — they can react more quickly. One step forward that I want to emphasize is that the NYPD has placed additional officers at the RCC, the Rail Control Center, in an effort to — so that we tighten collaboration and that they're getting this data which we get, which is not only over 911, but 311 through customers' reports on Slack. And it's in-house, but customer reports on social media, so that action can be taken more promptly. This is, as I say, still a work in progress, but never has there been this type of collaboration at this level between the NYPD and our, our, our transit operations teams and our customer service operations getting all these reports. So we hope and expect that that's going to start to uh, have some benefit. Another example of NY MTA and NYPT collaboration is the security camera program, much talked about. Every day, the MTA provides the NYPD with 19-plus video feeds for the, to help their investigation, 130-plus a week. We're able to deliver on these requests thanks to the fact that we have installed 10,000 cameras throughout the system, up from 6,000 just three and a half years ago. And more are coming as part of our historic capital program. Being in the enforcement business is not where we want to be. We're in the transit business. We want fast, reliable, safe, comfortable transit. But we owe it to the New Yorkers who don't have a choice but to use transit to focus on their safety. Because let me tell you, when things — when disorder affects people who don't have a choice — and I want to tell you one story. On the day after Christmas, at 6.30 in the morning, there was a train coming — on the J train coming from, you know, the, some of the lower-income neighborhoods of our city. These are people who have to get up the day, out of Chris, day after Christmas and go to work. Those are essential workers. Those are people who don't have all the choices of working remotely at a computer. At 6.30 in the morning, those people spent two and a half hours stuck because 
there were some people running around the platforms, on, on the elevated line, I should say, that the NYPD could not apprehend. So disorder in the system is most impactful for people who don't have a choice. And it is not a matter of, of that we want to be in the enforcement business. It's about protecting our New Yorkers, and it's an equity issue. <coughs> One of the things that's eroding the sense of order and fairness in our system, and or maybe in our society at large, is seeing other people enter through the emergency gates or walk by the bus operator without paying the fare, or obscure their license plate or get a fake out-of-state license plate so they don't have to pay tolls. I announced yesterday that I put together a panel to take a fresh look at this issue. This is not a fare evasion crackdown. This is trying to develop a new strategy for how do we arrest what is growing and I think is at the verge of becoming an epidemic. The rationale is not to look at only the financial impacts, although those are huge. It's one important aspect of dealing with our safety challenges. Uh, fair evasion enforcement does pick up criminals and people with weapons before they get into the system. It's one way of interdicting people who would commit crime. And over time, the knowledge that there is fair evasion enforcement, we hope and expect, will deter the bad guys from coming into the system to do crime in the first place. But equally important, controlling fair evasion is about repairing our social fabric. I know this sounds airy-fairy at a time when we are facing, you know, serious problems of safety, but it's real. The system only works when everybody contributes. Honest and hardworking New Yorkers, many of them on fixed incomes, are telling us that they are outraged and demoralized when they see people who are better off as I say, carrying $7 lattes, and we have this on video, waltzing through the emergency exit gates. It makes customers feel like suckers, and it makes them wonder, why should I pay the fare? The panel that I established or convened comprises a diverse coalition of leading New Yorkers, including our colleague David Jones, who has made among his uh, who's made a, a, a consistent message to all of us about if we're serious about fair evasion, it must be done on an equitable and even-handed basis. It is a first principle of this discussion. But it also includes New York City Schools Chancellor David Banks because I want to include education in this solution. I think it has to be part of it. And a wide range of people representing civil rights organizations, activist organizations like the Asian American Federation, rider groups, and others. Their mission is to look at a wide range of strategies, including, as I say, a fresh approach to education and messaging to help reestablish that paying the fare is basic civic behavior, but also examining stuff that we can do, we can do, to deter fare evasion like having a better turnstile design, dealing with these emergency exit gates, which are obviously so porous, and also focusing on affordability. We never want fare evasion to be a crime of poverty. We have to deal with affordability. We have to address all of the affordability issues, starting with expanding the, uh, the penetration of the fair fares program into the low-income part of New York City, and maybe even, as one uh, of the public speakers said, increasing eligibility. We have to get it, these fair fares cards into people's hands, and we need to work with the city to get the word out. There's also an enforcement component to consider, but it needs to be done, as I say, in a way that's equitable and responsive to concerns about social justice. My hope is that the panel will point the way to a system that does not criminalize young people who make mistakes and who need to be, you know, who we need to be given a, a little education rather than a huge fine that we could build up over time. But, but really to focus the effort on recidivists and real criminals, violent criminals who are a threat to our passengers. We hope and expect to have a, a report 
done this summer. I can't tell you exactly when it's going to be done because we haven't convened. Um, but but that's the goal. We need to be, I hope, turn, you know, into next fall, starting to really attack with some of these new strategies. Little less um, emotional matters, but ones that I think everyone's happy about. Um, we obviously, uh, it was discussed by, by one of our public commenters. We published the MTA Open Data Plan. This has been an area of controversy for some time, and we are actually publishing, you know, hunt nearly 100 data sets. I just want to thank Sarah Meyer, who took on this task in addition to her role as being the Chief Customer Officer. Um, we're, we're working with advocates and elected officials and gathering input from riders to make sure it's useful. And I just want to say the open data plan, without getting technical, is a living document and it's going to evolve so we can be more responsive to the public. There are a lot of different opinions about what data is useful. We want to hear it all and we want to improve as we go. Lastly, I want to take a moment to talk about Earth Day, which was last week. We celebrated by spotlighting the electric bus program, the zero emissions bus program. We were joined by Governor Hochul at an event to talk about the next step in our transition to that zero emissions fleet. 60 buses, the first uh, delivery of 60 buses headed to six depots where they will serve environmental justice communities in all five boroughs. We're focusing on areas that have high rates of asthma and air pollution um, throughout the city to try to make this part of the environmental justice agenda. I think this is an incredibly exciting development, but it, we have to be clear that it's just the first step in a complex process that's going to take some time. There's a widespread impression that going zero emissions is just a little like deciding to go to the Tesla dealer instead of going to the Chevy dealer. Actually switching from electric to electric from diesel and even to less polluting compressed natural gas buses and hybrid buses is enormous undertaking. We need as a board to understand. Sunil Nair, who's leading our electric bus program, is here. We're hoping to have enough time to get into that presentation. Um, but not to get into too much detail, zero emissions buses are more expensive than diesel. Right now, we're waiting for that to change as the market develops. And there are extremely limited number of qualified manufacturers. So we, we, and, we and the buses are still in evolution. Uh, when it comes to battery life and weatherproofing. So this is a process that's underway, and every transit agency in the country, good news, the Biden administration has provided a, a, a separate category of funding in the, in, the, in the Biden infrastructure bill, but there's a lot of competition for that manufacturing capacity. It's not like the challenges are going to stop once we get the buses. There are 12,000 operators and 3,500 mechanics to, to, to train, and we'll need to install chargers and electric-related infrastructure at all of our 28 bus depots. These are, at best, mid-20th century buildings that need to be retrofitted completely to accommodate this 21st century technology. Power upgrades, enough together to power a small city, and at every step, our depots need to remain in service. So this huge construction project of the charging infrastructure needs to take place while Craig and Frank are still running service and, God willing, getting it a lot faster because we all know that that is one of our top priorities. But we're determined. We're putting in a request for federal funding for over $100 million towards the cost of our next phase of deployments, and we're going to push hard to get what we deserve. The MTA carries 14 percent of the nation's bus passengers and operates 10 percent of all the buses in the United States. Subways, it's even more percentage-wise, but buses is huge. We deserve comparable funding. You know, this is something I talk about a lot. Um, we're hoping that over time, the historic underfunding of the MTA relative to our — the size of our system is going to be addressed um, with the leadership of our great uh, congressional delegation. So I'm going to stop there and hand it over to Sunil. Somebody tell me how much time we have um, on the calendar. Uh, we have 30 minutes. We have 30 minutes. Okay. I'm so sorry. Frank. 
Frank Anacaro, who runs the New York City Transit Bus Operation. Frank. Jana, can I just say something before? Please. So I just wanted to thank you um, for your words yesterday, because not only did you say that you were going to take care of fare evasion, but you were also going to look at toll evasion as well. So that's something very important. I know Andrew and David, before I even joined this board, have been um, holding the torch on this, but thank you on behalf of New York City Transit for this, too. Thank you, everybody. Back to you, Frank. Okay. Presentation. Uh, good morning. Thank you for allowing me to speak about our journey to a zero emissions fleet. As Jano mentioned last month, a 21st century bus fleet is one of MTA's top seven priorities. Governor Hochul and Chair Lieber mentioned at the press event on Earth Day last week we are laser focused on speeding up this transition and cementing our status as a national leader in the fight against climate change. The MTA has committed to a zero emissions bus fleet by 2040, and we'll speak about how we're going to get there. Before we get into that, I want to take a moment to talk about why to get to a zero emissions bus fleet, and it's very important. As Jano said earlier, public transportation is already one of the most effective strategies that any community can take to reduce emissions. Thanks to the MTA's transit system, New York has the lowest carbon footprint per capita in the entire country. That said, our own buildings and vehicles do emit 2 million metric tons of greenhouse gases each year. But the good news is we can reduce that by 25 percent by transitioning to a zero emissions fleet. This is important to our region as well as to our local communities. Zero emission buses will reduce air pollution and improve public health. Electric buses are also quieter than regular buses, reducing noise pollution. There are a lot of important reasons for these investments. And now I'm turning it over to Sunil, a chief officer in buses who heading up the zero emission fleet transformation. Thanks, Sunil. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Frank, and it's good to see you. Uh, it's a real honor for me to address the board on this important MTA initiative. I very, very much uh, appreciate the opportunity, and uh, thank you. I'll briefly take you through the path to getting forward to 100% zero emissions by 2040, the charging infrastructure plan that we've developed, the energy demands that are needed to get, get us to this, uh, this level, and, of course, the challenges and opportunities that come along with the transition. The picture that you see there on the screen is one of the 15 all-electric buses that we procured back in service in 2020. It's been running in service every day. This, along with 10 leased buses before that, taught us a lot in terms of the technology, in terms of, the, in terms of understanding the space itself, because the space is very different from the diesel and the CNG space. And it was incredibly useful in terms of us moving forward with the next steps. Just last November, this board approved an order for 60 electric buses uh, to New Flyer, and those buses, the first of those buses, are going to start to come to the property later this year with all the buses on the property over the course of next year. We are really excited about that. So that is, that, it's, a, it's a fantastic uh, op opportunity. Um, well, we're not stopping there. Uh, at the end of this year, we plan to put out a procurement solicitation that is in line with our capital plan. This capital plan calls for up to 500 buses across 10 uh, locations. So we are putting out a, a procurement solicitation to procure another 470 buses. Uh, that will be put out publicly. It's a, it's a competitive RFP, and uh, we expect those buses to come on the property by the 2025 timeline. So in this sense, in, in terms of you know increasing our buses, working, uh, 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 logically, with every capital plan, we hope to increase our r run rate with respect to the buses so that we get to all 58 of our, uh, 5,800 of our buses to a zero emissions basis by 2040. Next slide, please. While um, I do not want to make light of it, uh, buying, li uh, buying buses is, quote, unquote, the easy part. The complex part, as Jana was mentioning, was really lining up the charging infrastructure to make sure that these buses charge on an easy, efficient, and a fast basis. That's, that's, that's key to our transformation. So the picture that you see there shows 50, uh, 16 uh, chargers lined up at MJ Quill Depot uh, charging our 15 uh, all-electric buses, and they have been working on a daily basis. We learn a lot from that charging experience as well as running the buses also. 
as was uh, announced Friday by Jano. The 60 buses coming online in 2023, we are installing charging equipment at five additional depots in, in the outer boroughs. The depots are Jamaica, East New York, Kingsbridge, Grand Avenue, and Charleston. Now, transforming our depots is a fairly extensive uh, and a complex undertaking, and we are uh, doing our planning well in advance to make sure that we are on the task. Many of our depots are over a century old, and uh, we have to work thoroughly to make sure we understand the constraints at our depot. Many of our depots have you know, low ceilings, uh, electrical distribution rooms that may not be appropriate and things like that. So there is work ahead of us in terms of the capital plan and the changes there. So um, it just does not end with the charging infrastructure itself. Another piece of the puzzle is making sure that you have enough energy to charge your buses at the right rate, at the right time, and things like that. A large percentage of our depots will need additional power from the electrical grid. In fact, as part of this 60 bus procurement, we have already started to work with our partners at Con Ed to, to supply approximately 10 megawatts of additional power at one of the depots. That's just the start, right? At this point, we estimate that our system-wide power demands would be about 370 megawatts of additional power. That's new power that needs to be sourced from the system. We have proactively started to engage with uh, Con Edison to make sure that they understand you know, what the upcoming needs are over the next 17 to 18 years as we get uh, along this journey. The, the power that I mentioned, the 370 megawatts that I mentioned, is equivalent, equivalent to lighting up 180,000 to 200,000 homes. So it, it is a lot of power that we are talking about. You know? and, and again, we cannot do this alone. This, we are working really closely with Con Edison, NIPA, NYSERDA, and all the other regional partners to get to where we need to get to. Next slide, please. So one aspect that I really wanted to highlight was um, um, we are making sure that any um, depot rebuild or any kind of uh, redevelopment that we are planning has zero emissions in its DNA as you start to rebuild or redevelop. A prime example of this, uh, or actually two prime examples of this, is the Jamaica Depot rebuild, rebuild as well as the Gun Hill Road redevelopment. Both of them have absolutely taken the zero emissions mindset in their design build process. Jamaica Bus Depot in Queens will be redeveloped to support a fully 100% zero emissions bus depot in the future. In fact, when it's opening, it's going to open with 60 zero emissions buses right out of the depot on opening day. Gun Hill redevelopment is another exciting opportunity. It includes 160,000 square feet of space that will be finished to exacting NYCT specifications that will allow us to house a zero emissions fleet at that location. So both of these are good examples of projects where you know the zero emissions mindset is in the project at the time of inception itself. Well, now that we've uh, uh, talked through our uh, kind of road ahead, and this is a really quick introduction uh, with respect to the road ahead, I want to talk through some potential challenges and opportunities. The urban environment that we run in is fairly tricky. You know, you have stop and go traffic, you have cold weather conditions of the Northeast, you have elevation changes. All of these are uh, additional uh, you know, uh, issues with battery manufacturers, and we have to make sure that our bus manufacturers understand this so that they build our buses appropriate to the New York City region and the specific New York City constraints. There are significant issues with the supply chain. You know, lithium is being used by just about every manufacturer in the world at this point. So supply chain is going to become an issue. So we have to make sure that bus manufacturers' order books are filled with our orders so that they can plan their supply chains appropriately. On the manufacturing side, uh, we have one qualified bus vendor right now, and we are working with multiple other bus vendors to make sure that we have a pool of bus vendors that we can bid from. So that, that's another challenge that we have to work with. We, we, we must also ensure that our workforce is adequately trained. Uh, this is new technology, and with new technology comes new challenges. But I look at it as new, new opportunities for our workforce to, to learn new pieces, both in terms of electrical engineering, power engineering, energy, and things like that. So I think it's a great opportunity for our workforce to make sure that they are up to speed with all these technologies. And we are making sure to work with our union partners to ensure that the workforce is in line, and we are putting those training programs in place early on so that as the buses start to come, we have those programs ready. 
And lastly, costs. Right now, we expect costs to decrease, but right now, electric buses are about 60% more expensive than their uh, you know, equivalent diesel buses. So that's, that's going to change, but, um, uh, but right now they are expensive. So we are making sure that we're working with the FTA in terms of apportioning all grants that are available to make full on our capital program to you know, fund our bus, uh, bus purchases, infrastructure purchases, and any rebuilds that are needed. Um, in terms of you know, reducing costs, we are, we are em employing what's called smart charging strategies that will allow us to charge these buses at appropriate times so that our electricity costs remain low. And we are also evaluating um, avenues where you can share power with subways so that we, the ask of Con Ed would be that much lesser. So these are all things in the works that work that we are um, actually working on. And lastly, an important aspect of electric buses is making sure that you're resilient and redundant with respect to your uh, power grid itself. And we, are, uh, so we have started to eva evaluate hydrogen fuel cell buses as an alternative to battery electric buses. So that's also in the works. Yeah, and in addition, solar-based battery energy storage systems. Agreed, it's a really complex uh, 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 transformation, but um, rest assured, you have a good team that stands behind this uh, and individuals who are qualified to run this program. I'll hand this over to my boss, uh, Frank, now, who will take you through the rest of this. Thanks, Sunil. Okay. So in closing, as we continue to electrify our depots uh, and meet the 2040 commitment, we'll need to prioritize investments in fair and equitable way as possible, as, as Jano mentioned earlier. We'll continue to deploy these electric buses or, or zero emission buses in socially and economically vulnerable communities as we've been since we started. These communities will benefit from the cleaner air and noise reduction also. In addition, we, you know, there's some other logistical considerations, technical considerations, as mentioned, uh, grid capacity excuse me, grid capacity, uh, condition of our facilities, routes, schedules, and geographic distribution that need to be considered. So, and, you know, basically, really in closing, the opportunity is tremendous. Uh, a zero emission bus fleet will reduce our carbon emissions by 500,000 metric tons annually. We can't pass this up. Uh, as in any major endeavor, we're working with a very large number of, of players internally and externally. Uh, this initiative is a nationwide transition to zero emissions, and there are thousands of individuals pouring a lot of time and energy and efforts into this to make this happen. The more we share, the more we learn, the sooner we can get where we need to be. So uh, getting to zero, mission, zero emissions is mission critical for us because we know buses are true engines of equity in this city. Thank you for your time. Invite questions. Uh, Mr. Albert. Thank you, Sunil and Frank, for the presentation. Very informational. Have you been able to ascertain if there's a differential in charging time between the Arctics and the standard buses? So, uh, so for an Arctic bus, Arctic buses typically have larger batteries. Standard buses have smaller batteries. You know, uh, the charging times would vary depending on the size of the batteries. Uh, that said. If you put a charge, if you put an Arctic battery under a high power charger, it would charge faster. So it really depends upon you know how 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 high power your charger is and how, how what's the size of your battery. So will that be a determining factor in what routes you assign buses to, depending on where the charging stations happen to be located, or are there going to be you know mid route charging stations as well? Should the bus say that it's it's low? Right. That's a great question. Um, at this point, we feel that the technology is improving in terms of battery capacities. In fact, the latest set of 40-foot buses have a much larger capacity than the existing 15 articulated buses, which means that the battery capacities and battery chemistries are going to necessarily improve. Oh, that's good. Which means, you know, as we go forward, uh, uh, it gets uh, better. Mo just about all of our schedules may be um, in line, you know? Terrific. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. Board Member, Bar Bar Board Member Barbas. Thank you. Great presentation. So exciting to be involved in this, isn't it? Um, I was just wondering, and I hope you have this in hand, that the bus depots, which are a big investment, are designed with all the 
imaginations of what the future building may have to adapt to. So right now, as you mentioned, Sunil, there's a technology that we know, but there's technology that's coming to us over the decades. So as long as the building, which is an expensive investment, is designed to adapt to all the things we can envision, elevation-wise too, for sea level, everything you can think of, so that it can be made to adapt and maybe piggyback other ideas. I don't know, is this a place where it could possibly be some sort of facility in the future that looks a little different? So um, good job, and I, and I hope you think of it in that way. I'm sure you have designers on board that have that vision. Um, if I, if I may, Frank, uh, board member, I'll just respond to that. Sunil mentioned that we have two depots in the pipeline um, that will, you know, we have upgrades being made to existing depots, but two new depots, Jamaica Bus Depot and a shared use depot uh, at Gun Hill Road that will be part of a redevelopment of a logistics warehouse. Um, both of those are really structured for innovation. Jamaica Bus Depot, which we're uh, actually going out to seek qualifications for uh, this week, uh, is a design build. So we'll be able to put specifications out there and seek uh, private input into how that gets done. And then uh, Gun Hill Road will be part of what we think will be a very advanced, very green logistics warehouse. Um, so we expect to take advantage there. And, and just as you say, you know, we have to make sure we accommodate technology in the future. Sunil mentioned some of the, the keys, you know, certainly having power capacity is important, headroom is important since equipment is often overhead, uh, and we'll make sure that that's all baked in and also seek that private innovation. Sounds good, Jamie. And also, um, if there's a design build procurement out, to actually award the design builder for that innovation within the procurement documents would be key. Thank you. Yes, good suggestion. Mr. Glucksman. Uh, thank you. Great presentation. I mean, since we're exploring all kinds of different things, I recently saw a, in the last week or so on the NBC Nightly News, there was a story about in Sweden where they have installed under the buses some special uh, receptors for to charge batteries. And in the street, the, under the pavement, there's a line going through which is constantly supplying the power for those buses. It might help. I mean, if you could get it done here in New York, it's another matter. But it's something that uh, you could certainly look up and find on the Internet. Thank you. So yeah, uh, what you're talking about is inductive charging, and that is absolutely that, that's something we are already starting to look at. Uh, I, we believe that the technology is still a little immature in terms of the amount of power conductivity and things like that. But absolutely, we totally hear you, and uh, it's it's uh, yeah, it's on our radar. Thank you. Other questions for the the bus team? I just want to acknowledge that Craig, Craig was planning on how we were going to get to zero emissions uh, about two and a half for three years ago before, you know, before the capital program kept, kept, was really funded, um, before COVID, um, Craig was already on this and um, strategizing about how do we, you know, all the different pieces of this incredible undertaking. So credit, credit to you and, and, and I, Frank is carrying that uh, mission forward tremendously. Um, I, uh, my, my team poked me because I didn't give folks at uh, the board a chance to comment on my comments, which is, a, um, which are, which are, you know, from the heart, but always have uh, sparked different views. Does anybody want to share, um, share any thoughts? On, okay. All right. Mr. Zuckerman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, look, thank you for your comments on fare evasion and certainly on safety. I think, uh, I feel it in the, the system, and uh, friends call me, as they know I'm a board member, and they, they raise it, and I think you're addressing a critical thing. I also want to thank our governor and the mayor for their commitments. The comments they've made in recent weeks uh, mean a lot to us. Um, as the chair of finance, I think I just need to reiterate some things that we all need to think about. We have a double whammy coming here. Now, we're very fortunate that we have federal funding to cover us through 2024 and five, but we have a double whammy, and that comes, one, from people working from home. It's become a, almost a part of people's compensation now. It's an expected part of people's behavior for a certain set of the population in certain worker groups. And then we have a second one, which is people meet, leaving New York for warmer and lower cost climates. And that's, those two things together will fundamentally, structurally harm our, our financial situation. 
Um, we've got to get a hold of that. We're doing our part. I hope we're going to do our part to fund the safety issues. I hope the, the city follows through on its offerings, and I agree with you, your uh, excitement and supportive with the mayor's comments. I hope we can do that. Um, and I look to the riding public. We need your help, too. Um, you got to go to the office. You got to go to the theater. And you got to stay in New York because if those things don't happen, the structural imbalance will be permanent. And there is no fair increase that can close that budget gap. So you got to stay here and you got to go to the office. And we can't make you do that, but it's fun to ride the subway. It's fun to go to the office to see your colleagues. We're doing it here at the MTA. So please, we need your help because that is the only way the structural gap will no longer be structural. Thank you, sir. Your, your, your comment brings home the point that none of us wants to, for this board to be forced to exercise those last resort options, which nobody wants. Fair hikes, service cuts, layoffs, it's just none of it desirable, acceptable, not stuff we want to do. We want to be growing service to reduce the equity disparities in our society. So service needs to grow, not to contract. We need our people. We don't need higher fares, right? So there is a, um, there's, there's really an issue that, that Neil is highlighting. Anybody else? Mr. Brigham. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, Jano, I know this <clears throat> might seem like a minor point, but I was very glad to hear that you say that uh, when you do the fare evasion that you would bring in the Department of Education as part of that. One of the things that has always struck me is the number of students that you see jumping the turnstiles. And you had mentioned about some of these high class people with their $7 lattes going through the slam gates. Well, I can tell you, a lot of those students jumping the turnstiles are wearing nice uniforms for these really nice prep, prep schools. So you know they can afford it, but they're doing it. And you got to get this ingrained in people early when they're young that fair evasion is wrong. I mean, apparently somewhere along the line that got lost. And we got to bring us to some of these major schools and let them know that, hey, you know, your kids are doing this and it's wrong and you got to set, set a standard for them. Thank you. That's why we're, we're including the educate the top tier of education folks in this because we, it's, it's not, it's not a, it's not really at the end of the day for that population enforcement issue, it's education. So, um, any other folks before we adjourn, uh, board member Cortez Vasquez. Hi. First of all, I want to acknowledge you and, and, and thank you for constantly bringing the conversation of equity and balance and dealing with historical inequities. And not only do you always say that, but we see it in all of the presentations, but we also see it in the building. You know, the fact that the model, the model depots are going to be in Jamaica and in Gun Hill Road, that too speaks to that. So. I think it, it's not a minor point. It's it's long overdue, and I just want to say that I really appreciate that you never have a meeting where you do not mention in one of the conversations, whether it's ridership, whether it's enforcement issues, the, it, and the way you present it, that these are young people that need education. Not all of them need to be penalized. And so that conversation of equity is what's going to get us to where we need to be. So I want to just thank you for that publicly. You. I know you've devoted your career to, to serving a population that needs equity and needs representation, so thank you. Okay. We're, we're, I think we're going to take a temporary uh, adjournment. The, the, the governor is going to join us in 15 minutes or so um, for uh, what we're all excited about, which is her participation in, in – she's going to say some words, and she's also going to participate with us in – honoring those MTA workers who, who did so much on the day of that attack. Um, okay. Any other business before we I move adjournment? Okay. What? We're not adjourning. I, I, am, I always manage to botch the logistics of Robert's Rules of Order. I'm going to be sent to remedial Robert's Rules of Order. We're taking a break, and we're going to be back in 15. Bye.
I, I am so thrilled to be able to welcome Governor Hochul to an MTA board meeting. Governor Hochul is the first sitting New York State governor to attend an MTA board meeting. It's, it's representative of a commitment that she's had to our mission since day one. Uh, within days of, um, of Governor Hochul taking office, she was in charge of helping us to um, wrestle through hurricanes and partial subway outages and her support for our mission and her experience as a local official um, shown through and helped uh, us to get to know each other and more important for New Yorkers to get to know her and her commitment to the MTA. So I just want to thank you again for all of your leadership and uh, thank you. So we're heading up to the podium oh. for okay. Thank you. Okay. Governor Hochul, thank you. As I, as I said to you privately, it is, a, it is an honor and a pleasure to have you here to honor our MTA colleagues for their roles in responding to the April 12th shooting. Even with all the training that employees undergo, you can't begin to appreciate what it's like to experience something like this horrific and tragic incident until it happens. But these brave transit workers stepped up like they always do, like you did through COVID, as I said, like you always do, to take care of New Yorkers and to take care of each other. Some are longtime employees, like DCSM Sheila Hudson, who's been with the MTA for 36 years. Where are you, Sheila? Or train conductor Raven Haynes, who I got to know a little bit, who's just got two years on the job. Raven, where are you? Our colleagues are the best in the business, the best. They represent the best of New York. It's their hard work that keeps the system running all day, day in and day out, rain or snow, all conditions. As I said, during a pandemic, they are the heart and soul of the MTA. We thank them. We thank them every day, but especially today, for your service and your dedication. Governor. Thank you. Good morning. Um, since Jan will point out I was the first sitting governor, I also want to see if I'd be the first standing governor, too. That's why, that's why I thought I'd come over here. And, uh, this is an honor for me, first of all, to our MTA board. Uh, it's not always easy. Sometimes you agree to do something, you're not quite sure what you're getting into, and there are certainly slings and arrows in all of our lines of work, but you show up every day as well. And I thank you for your commitment to ensuring the finest transportation system on this planet that is occurring right here because of your leadership and, of course, the great leadership of Jana Lieber, who uh, uh, I am in awe of every single day. You know, the responsibility that he has and the way he approaches his enormous duties. Uh, I'm really proud of you. Uh, proud to have you at my side. So uh, to Jana Lieber and Craig Cipriano, I want to thank him for being the interim president of the New York City Transit. I, let's always get rid of the word interim. I don't like interim words. I didn't like that with you. I don't like that. To, also, Sarah Meyer, our chief customer officer from the MTA. Uh, thank you. Uh, Demetrius Critchlow, I want to thank him for his work on the subways. Just wrote in on the five train. It was great. Everybody had their mask on. They looked, I could tell they were smiling to have the privilege to wear the mask. I somehow picked up on this vibe. They all seemed really happy to be there. It was, it was phenomenal. It was just a reminder of this is an incredible system and it works so well. And, uh, and also our representatives from TW100, uh, Tony Utano couldn't be here today, but uh, I want to thank Richard Davis, the chief of staff, for being here as well. So, but today is not about us. It's about the individuals who are here. The individuals who, as Jano mentioned, started out their normal days thinking it was going to be just an ordinary Tuesday. And you have titles like supervisor, train operators, conductor, cleaner, manager. While you had those titles when you woke up, 
by the end of the day, you also had a new title, and that was our hero. You were our heroes. And none of you went into this profession in search of that, I guarantee it. But simply by having the resiliency, the courage to keep doing what you do every day, but on this extraordinary day, you showed true grit and courage like only New Yorkers can. And that is why we come here, to show appreciation for what you had to endure, the images that you saw and experienced, I'm sure are seared in your minds. No one ever expects to see bloodstained platforms or people on the ground with wounds. Uh, that was not what you expected. But you reacted like professionals. And you made us all so very proud. And I can't tell you what that means to be the governor of a state with workers like you who just make us all shine. The entire state, 20 million New Yorkers, are proud of what you've accomplished. And you had your own risks. You took, you took a risk to your own safety. You didn't know if there were others. You didn't know what you were heading into. Just like a firefighter goes into a line of fire, you did your jobs beautifully. And for that, we are so grateful. And you kept calm. You helped terrified New Yorkers in search of leadership at that time when they're like, who do we turn to? You showed up and you helped them as well. And that just warms my heart. And we're forever grateful you know, for the aid you provided to passengers and working with the investigators in the response to make sure that the crime scene wasn't disturbed. We, this person was on the loose. We didn't know what else he was capable of doing when you have a heart so depraved that you would shoot children on their way to school, children that I spent the evening with, their parents, and saw the fear in their eyes and consoled them, through, sometimes through interpreters. It was a painful day on many ends, but all I knew is I didn't have to worry about the role you played. That was never in question. It was incredible. And I'll also say that our riders who we cherish deserve to have not just exceptional public servants like yourselves at the helm, they also deserve a riding experience free from fear. And that is what we are committed to do. This board, this city, this state, this leadership to ensure that the public is not just feeling safe, but they are safe. And that is our commitment, that we go forth, knowing that we have you as part of our army to protect our riders, to get them there safely, but also to send a message who those who dare violate the safety and security of our riders. You've gone too far. You've picked a fight you don't want to have. And we're ready for you. And working with the mayor and his commitment to send even more resources so there are more police officers on platforms and in trains. And our work with our law enforcement and the synergy that was not there in the past that I tell you is there today. This collaboration, this no need no boundaries and titles and jurisdictions, we're all in this together. And so we're going to continue making sure we address the issue with respect to individuals who should not be living on a subway or in a station. They deserve better. They deserve the sanctity of a good, safe roof over their heads as well. So I'm committed and have been recommitted since I stood with Mayor Adams on his first week on the job. Stood in the subway and said, we're going to get these teams out there, these professional, mental health professionals, to help lift these people up and help them heal and get a different opportunity in life and not to be there. But also for those who feel they can just bring weapons onto our trains and terrorize people, no longer, no longer. We're going to protect the people that we're charged with protecting. And it started months ago, but it's continuing with a reminder of what happened this past Tuesday, two Tuesdays ago, and we are even more committed. So we know how critically important the MTA is. It's the lifeline of our city. I enjoy taking and talk about potholes when I travel the whole state. I didn't feel any potholes. It was nice and smooth ride down. It was great. You know, uh, it was nice, very nice. Uh, but I also want to think about our other opportunities um, unrelated to this event. But while I'm here, um, I also want to talk about the rethinking of the air train. Okay. What are our options? We're going to need real leadership between the MTA and the Port Authority and the governor's office, and we'll get that done. And I also just want to remind you we convened an expert panel 
they're now engaged, as I've asked them to be, engaged with the community, getting the best ideas. There's ideas they came up with, but what does the community want? This is their mode of transportation. We need to look at the 14 options, everything from direct connections from the subway, bus options, a ferry option, uh, all kinds of exciting things. But in the meantime, every once in a while I peruse at the newspapers, saw a rather enlightened editorial, Daily News, and they suggested that we make the fares on the Q70 train free. Bus, bus. bus. Yeah. Uh, I thought that made a lot of sense, that the Q70 bus could be this interim means to let people know that this is a good way to get from the airport to the next station 10 minutes away. So when there's ideas that are out there that make sense to us, we're not going to debate it and study it and think about it for a long time. I'm a person of action. And fortunately, I have people of action around me who will say, yes, let's get that done. So I'll be looking for continued support for this. And I'm saying, we're approaching May. Let's get it done on May 1st. So starting May 1st, the fares on the Q70 bus will be suspended while we're going through our process of alternative means with the air trains. So let's just give people a little bit of good news here today as well. So I wanted to make that announcement while I was here with you. But at this point, it is time to recognize the people that I know don't feel like they're heroes, but I'm sorry, you are to us. <laughs> you are to us and your families and your community. And we're so indebted for what you did on that day two weeks ago. Thank you. My first up today is train operator from the N train at the center of it, David Artis. Next up is Mr. Artis's partner that day, the conductor Raven Haynes. Train operator of an R train was a station away. This is Joseph Frankie. His partner, the conductor, Dayron Williams. Now several employees who rushed into the danger zone that day, the general superintendent, Niall McGuire. Train Service Supervisor, Gilbert Rosado. <laughs> K-1 
conductor Jose Martinez. The line superintendent who grabbed colleagues and rushed in to assist, Mark Wolodarski. The district customer service manager responsible for the 36th Street Station, Sheila Hudson, was there that day. The group station manager, Rolando Hernandez. Group Station Manager, Lewis Lanfair. <laughs> Group Station Superintendent, Shante Adams. Cleaners who were at the station or responded to the station first, Angel Okendo. <laughs> Cleaner Charlene Gardner. Train service supervisor who stopped another train from entering the danger zone, Peter Stone. From the digital communications unit that informed hundreds of thousands of passengers what was happening with the trains and the stations, Tanya Brand Jones. Also from the Digital Communications Unit, Annie Mae Morrison. <laughs> also from the Digital Communications Unit, the manager who oversaw not only mass communications, but 5,500 individual communications with regular passengers, Tyler Scow.
And those are your honorees, everybody. One bit of a business here, board business, Jana Lieber. Because Robert's Rules of Order always, always governs. May I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second. Second. Any opposition? The meeting is adjourned. All right, and for the press, we will be returning right to that podium. You have an opportunity to ask some questions of the governor and Jano, and then later, Jano will do the regular news conference to which you are accustomed. In between the two, many of these honorees will be taking your questions up here as well. All right, so stay where you are. First, the governor and the chair. The honorees could just stay with us for a moment, please. We'll be taking some pictures in a moment. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any questions? Mm -hmm. She called on Clayton Gusa of the New York Daily News. Oh, okay, great. Uh, Governor, I wanted, to, or I wanted to ask two questions. One for Jano. Does the board need to approve uh, that fair freeze on the Q70? And two, uh, I, know it's, I know it's a fair freeze on the Q70, but at the same time, you're coming down here after uh, giving motorists a break, giving the Buffalo Bills a break, and all transit riders have seen by way of a break in the budget is um, Jano calling for more of them to pay their fares. So what do you say to transit riders who want uh, more money when, as the MTA faces a fiscal cliff in the next com in the next few years. We did not raise fares. Uh, there's not been a fare increase for a long time. I think there's a lot of thought that there would be a, an increase in our executive budget to raise fares, and that is what we did for the riders. We want to encourage them to come. It's still uh, a challenge for us to get the full ridership back after the pandemic, and the best we could do is to tell them no fare increase, as well as in places like this, suspending the fare increase. So this is something, uh, with respect to the first question, uh, May 1st, board approval. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we're, we, will, we will be going through a board process, but we have, you know, the financial backstop for this has, has, has been figured out, so it's, I think it'll be a, a, a routine bit of administrative business. And just to, just to underscore what the governor said about uh, Clayton, it's because of the governor's budget that we were able to, to avoid a fare increase for all of 2022, in addition to the delay, the, the fare increase that happened last year. So uh, I just don't want your readers to be confused about her contribution on that front. Thank you. All right, just time for a few more questions. Zach Fink down from Albany. Zach. confident that a bill will pass. And what do you make of their reluctance? Is this a result of strained relations coming out of the budget? No, this is simply, it's an extraordinary request when you think about it, but it's also fixing a law that is very flawed. Uh, the fact that the law does allow for individuals in these circumstances or an individual who has a terminal diagnosis that they're required to stay on the ballot. So sometimes circumstances happen in life and it puts a spotlight on a deficiency in our laws. So this has come up fairly recently. So, you know, this is out of the normal course of business for them to act with such haste, but we've had some very productive conversations and uh, we'll see what the outcome is. Marge. No, 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 we're not gonna, we don't do it that way in this house. A no, no, we don't do it that way in this house. Andrew Siff, next to you. You had a message for criminals that we're not going to take it, and you also had a, a message to riders that they deserve a safe system. Uh, MTA officials have talked about perception being reality. People don't feel safe right now. What is your message to New Yorkers about how long it will take for them to feel safe and confident about their ride every day? Also, the more people come on the subway. I mean, we had a time when there were very few people traveling, and we're not at full capacity in terms of people being back to their jobs. I mean, a lot of people are still working remotely. So I believe there'll be a critical mass of more people coming very soon. 
there's plenty of opportunities for people to understand it and to, if they've been away from it for a couple of years, to realize that there's more people on the subway. They'll see more of a police presence. I think that's critically important. I've spoken to Mary Adams about this from the very beginning. In fact, I talked to Mary de Blasio about this when I first became governor, saying we need a strong presence, a visible presence. It's a deterrent to someone who's in you know, planning to do something wrongdoing, but also it gives that sense of confidence. So it's impossible to ask anyone, you know, can you give me a date on which people will feel safe? So we're not going to venture there other than it is the highest priority of my administration, working with the Adams administration and working with our federal partners. I convened a task force back in January, nine states, first time ever. And the NYPD and the Boston PD have been working to get guns off the streets. They're now approaching over 2,000 guns. So part of it is gun interdiction. It's not just the subway. Getting guns off the streets, getting them out of hands of people, and so people won't even bring them on the subway. So it's a, and also just that sense of security they'll see when we start making sure that there's more people down there. So there's not a date, but in my mind, there is a real sense of urgency associated with this. And I thank the MTA for being such a great partner in this as well. David Meyer over there from the New York Post. Thank you, Tim. This is on behalf of my Albany colleague um, from the New York Post. Um, what do you say to Democratic Demo sorry. What do you say to Democratic legislators who say that you've needlessly antagonized them, their words, not mine, on issues like the Bill's stadium bail reform and now this lieutenant governor situation? I don't go into life needlessly antagonizing anyone. So I would say that uh, my, my view is to establish relationships. And people can disagree with me philosophically on one decision or another. Um, I was just up in the North Country in Plattsburgh yesterday where I actually went to a manufacturing facility where they're going to be continuing to build our hybrid buses. I made sure that they're moving fast. But every part of the state, when some part of a state gets something else, we spent over $550 million on the Olympic facilities up there, for example. Other parts of the state don't necessarily benefit. So that is an example of yet another regional priority, the enhancements we've made on the Long Island Railroad, for example. Even Penn Station, there's a lot of part of the state that does not benefit from that directly, but everybody knows we're trying to support every sector of the state. So with respect to that and the ballot reform, yes, I worked very hard to do whatever I could to ensure the safety of New Yorkers. It's the number one issue on their minds, and I would do it all over again. And what legislators will know about me and my governing style, I work collaboratively. I didn't have to play this out in a way of winners and losers. But I want to make sure that the, ultimately the winners are the people of New York. And there'll come a day when these legislators who may have a different point of view on what we did in the budget, they're going to have a, something else that we're going to work on collaboratively. And they're going to want my support. I'm going to want their support. And that's how we usher in a whole new day in New York government. Okay, we have time. Governor, it's time for one more, Marsha. Marsha. Um, just a little while ago, Governor um, General Lieber talked passionately about the need for riders to have the perception of safety as well as safety. Yesterday, the mayor of the city of New York also talked about that, saying that he was concerned that he was getting a lot of complaints because people see police officers looking at their phones instead of patrolling, and he's asking for New Yorkers to send pictures of police officers who are doing that. I wonder if you join in that, asking people to send pictures if they see police they don't think are doing their job, that, and if you think that that will add to the perception as well as the reality of safety on the subways. I have confidence in the NYPD to do their jobs as well as the MTA police officers. Uh, I'm grateful for what they do. And yes, people need a sense of security. There's multiple ways to accomplish that. But I think everyone knowing I have their back that I'll support them. I support the law enforcement efforts, but I also support people's need to feel safe. And so uh, everybody has their own tactics. Uh, mine is to make sure that there's plenty of resources. We spend a lot of money on gun interdiction and safety, as well as programs within communities to help people learn that there's other alternatives. And we've, been, we've tripled the amount of money for these violence disruptor programs. So I've got different approaches toward public safety, but I'll tell you the beneficiaries of this combined approach, the mayors and mine together, is that we're going to work to make sure all New Yorkers not just feel safer, but are safer. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time today. All right, go Governor, if you could just join the honorees, we get the honorees back for some pictures, please. Group photo. Thank you.
For the press, stay where you are. We're going to give you an opportunity, if you want it, to ask questions of the honorees. The actual employees will step up, and you can ask them questions if you choose. Yeah, you guys all ready? OK. All right. We. We, we have members here from who were on the incident train. We have supervisors along with members of our digital communication team that will be able to uh, uh, answer your questions. Um, so fire away. Yes. Either for the, the conductor or the train operator of the R train, uh, I'm just wondering uh, what, oh, I'm just wondering if you were aware that the the shooter apparently went on that train, and if so, what was going through your mind? The and and if you weren't, here. what's that? Oh, they're, they're not, not here? here. Who do we have left? The, we end, have the incident train, the, the end train, the incident train. train from the opposite direction. Okay, so then on the incident train, uh, <laughs> did did either of you, how close were you to the to the shooting incident as it was unfolding, and and what did you decide to do to to get people to safety? If you can go to the podium. Uh, okay, so my name is Conductor Raven Haynes. I was on the end train incident train. I was in the middle position. My partner was in the second car. He was actually the closest to the shooter. Um, so I wasn't close enough to physically see the person, but I was close enough to see the smoke when I opened up the train doors, as well as the passengers falling onto the platform. How did you decide what to do about it? Like, what, how were you able to communicate to get them on to the, to the next train, or what was the protocol there to help save people? Well, luckily for me, my PA system was actually loud and very much active, so I was able to actually make an announcement to my passengers that were on my train, as well as the passengers coming off the R train to board my train. I just wanted to make sure that they knew not to board my train, to make sure they were in a more safe environment and get away as quickly and safely as possible. I w was wondering to what extent you knew what was happening, obviously something critical. What did you know? How soon did you know it? And did anything in your training prepare you for anything like this? Um, I will say no amount of training can prepare you for an incident like that. You really just have to do your job to the best of your ability and hope that your quick thinking and I want to say basic common sense would help you get people to safety. Um, I didn't realize how bad the situation was until after the first R train left and then a D train left and then I left my position to help my partner. Yes, hi. How are you? Wait, where, where, where? Back here. <laughs> yeah. Hello, and congratulations. Thank you. I, I did actually, oh, to anybody who wants to answer, obviously you are made aware and are trained to a certain degree to respond to this. But what, what is it that you get or what are you told or trained to do uh, for various situations and how, and how best to respond? Um, personally, that's actually a union question in regards to our safety. All I will talk about is always doing our job to the best of our ability. Um, is there another question? Well, yeah, I mean, when you respond, are you told you have to, you know, have certain protocols? Um, with any job, you have basic protocols, whether it be police, FDNY, MTA, any civil service job has basic protocols and procedures to follow. But if you want to go in depth, that would be something that I physically would not be the one to do. Hi, uh, <laughs> Steve with WCBS Radio. First of all, congratulations and, and thank you for what you did. Uh, I wanted to just know what image is going to stick out in your mind from this experience. I'm sure it was incredibly traumatic and scary, but you know, a lot of bright spots too when you looked at what other New Yorkers did to help each other. When you look back on that morning, what image sticks out in your mind? The most amazing, helpful image that will stick to my mind was the retired military personnel that helped tie off someone's leg. I am definitely, and so my partner is also grateful for him being on the train. Because, you know, even with basic knowledge of how to deal with injuries, we're not prepared to deal with 
that. <laughs> Anyone else like to answer on, yeah, on that question? Like, no, come on, let's see it. <laughs> so what image sticks out in your mind from, from that morning? Uh, chaos. Chaos in the making. Media, any more questions? Yes. To the gentleman in the in the pink shirt, and forgive me if I'm, I'm misremembering your, your story, but they said you grabbed others to go to to help. Can you just walk us through that? Why you knew that you needed to bring team members to bear? How you knew it was so bad so quickly, and then what you initially saw? All right. Well, um, I was in my office um, at the 38th Street Yard, uh, which is uh, right up the block from 36th Street Station. Um, our office is in the same building as the, uh, the tower, uh, Murphy Tower, which controls the area. Um, I had my door open and I heard the dispatcher on the radio um, ordering trains to uh, bypass the station at 36th Street. And to me, that trains bypass stations all the time if, if they're behind you know, uh, schedule for various reasons. But when I heard them say to bypass an express stop, I, I, I felt something was wrong. I went into the tower and I was told that there was um, an explosion on a train and there were passengers falling onto the platform. Um, I immediately um, thought mechanical, something mechanical was wrong. Um, I, I went to my, my manager and uh, other personnel uh, in, in the tower with me and I said we have we have a, an emergency, and we jumped in a, uh, two different vehicles, and we drove over there. We were there within about 10 minutes. And um, when we got into the station, we, we didn't know what was happening. I only became aware of the severity when I saw people being carried out and the amount of blood on the platform. But it's something that we, we do without, um, without question. That's our job. We have to keep the trains moving. We have to keep the people safe. Just real quick for one of the cleaners, I think, behind you. No cleaners there? Digital, no, no cleaners. Digital. Supervision. Supervision. Anyone uh, in the back there uh, with an image along the lines of what was asked, what will stick out for you, what you saw, what you heard? Sure. So um, I was in the rail control center when the reports of this incident started coming over the, the sits wire, the communications channels, and immediately, you know, it was obvious something more severe than a usual incident was coming over. Uh, staff rushed over to the area to start just, you know, getting everyone to safety, determining what was going on. And then uh, me and then my Tanya and Annie behind us, we all were working together to determine what was the impact of train service, how, you know, obviously there's gotta be some sort of disruption. How can we make sure, uh, what kind of alternative routes do people have? How can we get that out to them as quickly as possible? So in the Rail Control Center, it was just a lot of collaboration, everyone working together to make sure everyone was safe and everyone could get where they needed to go despite um, the incident that was happening. If just the gentleman who spoke could uh, go up one by one, say, and spell your name and, and title, please. I believe you, ma'am, already did that. My name is train operator David Artis. A-R-T-I-S. Um, Mark, M-A-R-K, last name is W-O-L-O-D-A-R-S-K-Y, and uh, the title is Line Superintendent, uh, Wolodarski. Tyler Stow, uh, S-C-H-O-W. Oh, sorry. Uh, customer Communications Manager. Hi, my question is for uh, Raven and David. Uh, if you could go back to that moment, is there anything that, uh, that you would change about how you responded to the situation? Any, like anything that you regret about, the, about what happened? No, no. We did it. I did everything I was supposed to do. My partner was listening. She did everything she was supposed to do. No one was killed. Everybody survived. So no, I went. Thank you very much. Uh, any further questions from anyone else in the media? All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.
afternoon, everybody. Um, look, we, the, for us at the MTA, it was very exciting to have the governor here. We never had a sitting governor come to an MTA board meeting before. But it was also more exciting to be able to honor 18 people uh, who were participants in the incredible MTA workforce response to the uh, Sunset Park shooting. I was on the platform that day and saw what what the situation was, what those people were dealing with um, as they responded. Uh, I was on the platform after, obviously, after the event. But this is 18 people. There were literally hundreds of people who participated in helping New York to get through that, not just uh, the train operator who waved people onto the, uh, onto the departing train to get them out of harm's way, but bus drivers who uh, stepped up with, and were able to add extra buses to move people when we had to shut down a portion of the lines in Brooklyn. All the passenger service professionals who are both online and on the phone and through our digital communications um, responded to try to help people figure out how to move around the city under those difficult circumstances. Just hundreds and hundreds of people were proud of MTA workforce every day and we were especially proud of them today when they were able to be recognized by the governor. So um, with that, let the uh, Mintonian show begin. Marsha Kramer, CBS2. There you go. So a little while ago, you were talking about the fact that there were uh, more police on the subway, that you have data that shows there's an increase in the number of swipes yeah. done by uh, police officers. But I wonder if you share the mayor's concern that uh, people are seeing a number of police officers who are on their phones or standing by the token booth and in terms of riders not doing their job. I wonder if you think, if you share the frustration and if you also think it's helpful that the mayor is calling for people to send pictures of the um, police officers who are on their phones when they see them? So, look, look um, I, I am going to let the mayor of the city of New York, who runs the NYPD, who is an ex-transit cop and who knows uh, the NYPD up and down, along with his police commissioner, who is a lifelong tra uh, law enforcement professional, decide how they can most effectively and most productively deploy people and how they evaluate performance. That is their expertise. What I'm thrilled about is that we have a mayor who's an ex-transit cop who's saying exactly what I asked for before he became mayor, which is we want cops on trains, cops on platforms. That's where the riders feel vulnerable. And the mayor is saying it, he's doing it, and we at the MTA have to welcome that. But do you still think that there's a perception that people have that they're not safe, that they're, especially after the Sunset Park incident? Yeah, and that's what we're trying to, we're trying to address the perception that they don't feel safe and the reality, because we're not, we're not oblivious to this, the statistics. Um, and we're also, as I said in the, presented in the board meeting, trying to address the perception, part of the perception of a lack of safety is also what sometimes get termed quality of life issues. The, the, the rule breaking that goes on that makes people, because they're in a confined space, feel vulnerable, even if above ground they might not react that way. All right, Dave Colon from Streets Blog. Dave, good afternoon. I didn't even ask you, hold on. Um, so I got a couple for you, Jano. Uh, one is uh, yesterday at uh, the Abney breakfast, uh, when they termed you the uh, train stepdaddy, uh, you were talking about uh, the subway as a sacred space, a public square like uh, Times Square, uh, Prospect Park, a synagogue, a mosque. Uh, I'm just kind of curious, why uh, is the subway the only one out of those areas that uh, has an entrance fee attached to it that sometimes is enforced with uh, violence? I'm, 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 I'm really not sure how to answer that. All we're trying to do is to, to create a, a, a process, an environment where New Yorkers all pay their fare so nobody feels like a sucker, nobody of limited means on a fixed income feels takes advantage, taken advantage of. And, um, and as I, I, I think as I made clear yesterday, we're going to do it with people who are experts in how to do that fairly, and we're including them on the panel. So um, other than that, I'm, I, I think we made, I made the point yesterday, we're going to do this 
uh, in a very even-handed way. Uh, just rhetorically, you don't know if that's like a, another kind of invitation to why aren't we doing free transit? I don't know. I'll, I'll leave it to you to answer no. that question. Okay. Um, and the other one is I had um, uh, there's a few things obviously that are kind of threatening the bottom line of the MTA. You, you guys have a, a riders not returning to crime, but there's also this issue of changing commute patterns, um, and people are just kind of. I think even big companies, uh, J.P. Morgan has said they're not doing uh, returns to the office and things like that, or not as much as they did. Um, so are we going to see a blue ribbon panel? Are we going to see a real sense of urgency in finding ways to kind of find new ways to make uh, off-peak uh, transit service, weekend transit service uh, uh, more frequent uh, to kind of make uh, transit service into uh, the first choice for people, the first thing that they think of instead of getting downstairs at the F train at 11 o'clock at night and going, oh, great, 16 minutes uh, for another one of these. So definitely we do want, number one, off hours and on weekends we actually seen return to transit at higher rates than in the peak, uh, in the, the, the traditional weekday commuting peaks. That's a positive sign. What that tells us is New Yorkers are ready to ride transit um, the principal thing that's holding them back, frankly, is that, that not all companies are, uh, have, gone, have, have reestablished office work or certainly in the same proportion. So that's the principal issue that's changing. As for what type of service or frequency of service we provide on the weekends, um, I think it's a fair question. Definitely part of the impact um, that you're describing is that we're, there's a really aggressive effort to complete the capital program and getting work done on the weekends. Um, but I will, be, I will be going back to look at whether that is actually Im impeding quality of service and something I'm interested in taking a look at. So this is going to be something right. that the board kind of tackles the same way? First thing always is the professionals take a look at it. And we'll see whether it's, it, it's something that, that needs board attention. But we'll All right, take we're, a look. we're moving on. The person who traveled the furthest today to be with you, N.J. Burkett, back from the Arizona desert for Eyewitness News. N.J. Uh, Thanks, Tim. Sorry about that, Mr. Lieber. Um, you, you have said, sir, more than once that you think there's a direct connection between people who don't pay the fare and violent crime, serious crime, in the subway system. Can you explain that logic to us? Sure. So um, uh, there is, uh, if we can interdict people at the fare gate, two things happen. One, and it's been proven over time, if there is even-handed uh, and non-discriminatory fare evasion, you catch a lot of people because rule breakers who break the rules and fare evasion are more disproportionately likely to be people who, for whatever reason, have weapons or have criminal warrants out for them. That's number one. The, but the bigger goal is deterrence because the, it's hardly a newsflash that the people who commit crimes don't generally slow down to swipe or tap. And we want them to feel like entering the subway system or entering our mass transit system is going to put them at risk of being collared, especially if they're carrying weapons. And it has a, a valuable deterrent impact. That's the, that's the way we look at it. But the bigger issue is the, the other thing, which I talked about a lot yesterday, is we want everybody to feel um, like the subway system and our mass transit system is fair, and there are a lot of New Yorkers on fixed incomes or people of lower incomes who are getting frustrated and demoralized by seeing a lot of folks, especially people in better off neighborhoods, who are beating the fare, and we have to address it. So we, we formed a, folks, a group of folks to, to answer. criminalizing poverty in doing that. What, what's your answer? It, it, absolutely not. The, if you, the, what I said was, number one, we, we were part of this panel's uh, agenda is to address issues of affordability. One, we have kept the fare flat. Two, we've added discounts. Three, we are looking at growing fair fares, which has personally been a priority, which provides hugely discounted metro cards to people below the poverty line. So to the contrary, we're looking to make it not a crime of poverty, but we're also trying to make sure that people who do have the means pay and they're fair to each other. That's the goal. All right, also traveling from out east, Alfonso Castillo is here with us the in sage person of today Valley from Stream. Newsday. Alfonso. Hi, Jenna. 
Um, a couple questions about crime uh, on the Long Island Railroad. I know most of the discussion is uh, focused on the subways, but crime's up 71% um, through March on the Long Island Railroad. And different than in the city, this is your police force. You, you do have say in, in how you use them. Um, can, can you talk about whether there's enough being done to uh, address crime uh, on the Long Island Railroad? And if not, what could and should be done? That well, I for, for, well, I'll tell you what, uh, what I did um, since I came into this position is to increase train patrols, because I think that the first priority for railroad customers is to feel safe, that they have to feel safe traveling on the trains. And they let us know, as do our subway customers and our bus customers, that seeing a, 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 a cop, a uniformed police person, is how they feel, get to feel more comfortable and safer. And so we increase train patrols. Uh, I, we are going to take a look at where that additional crime is taking place. But we wanted to make sure where, where people are in the commuter railroad system for the longest time, which is on the train, um, that they feel safe and that they are safe. So that's been the first level response. We'll take a look at what, where that's occurring and, and how we respond to it. And, and a quick follow-up. Uh, you talked about how you think that the perception of safety uh, had a hand in uh, maybe plateauing ridership on the subways. There's some evidence that ridership's also plateaued on, on the railroads. Do you think that that same perception is affecting the return to riders uh, on the commuter railroads? Well, I, all I can tell you is that a huge proportion of our commuter railroad customers also ride the subway and the buses to get where they're going. So I think that there is that the, the distinction is not that great, that the folks who are riding the rails uh, on Metro North and Long Island Railroad are hearing and, and perceiving a lot of the same issues that we're hearing from our customers on New York City Transit. All right, Michelle Kasky down there from Bloomberg News. Michelle. Hi, Jano. Um, you know, you've talked a lot about, uh, you know, the, the projected $2 billion deficit uh, out in 2026, but uh, it, it looks like there's a, a near-term problem as well. Um, um, folks on the Finance Committee, it was discussed on Monday that uh, with fair revenue um, coming in below budgeted estimates that it's, if, if ridership really doesn't improve this year and increase, and you don't get to the levels that you budgeted for, uh, you'll be looking at a deficit in this year. So what are you doing um, to address that? And then my second question is about debt service. Okay. Mm -hmm. First, the, the our, our, number one, our projections about ridership revenue were based on the old projections, which are outdated. We acknowledge that, and we are updating them, and that will be reflected in the July plan. Two, the under... And we know that we are behind where we expect it to be, and it's principally related to Omicron. That projection, original McKinsey projection, only had two waves. Omicron set us back again. Um, but interestingly, Michelle, you may have seen it, the, the, the revenues from the other MTA revenue sources were up mm -hmm. above projection. So there isn't that much of a gap in the current year. The bottom line is we are go we, we are in the same place that we thought we were right now projecting a roughly $2 billion fiscal cliff in 2026. We're going to adjust that in the July plan to reflect current ridership projections. It could go up further. Um, so nothing has changed. It's just what we've been telling everybody. We need the legislature and folk, other folks in Albany to start to come up with a plan for how do we fill what looks like a significant fiscal cliff once the money from Washington runs out. Yeah, we're yeah. exactly where we always were. Yeah, for 2026. But do you anticipate like having to speed that up and, and getting that additional help from Albany and the city for this year, for this no. budget? No, the, well, the, the money from Washington is not going to run out this year. No, no, we know that. But if ridership doesn't come in and improve... Um, I think I answered the question, mm -hmm. but go ahead. Okay. And then also on Monday... Uh, 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 Comptroller DiNapoli put out his uh, his report, his annual report, and you know he was talking about how debt service is is projected to reach, you know, 4.3 billion in 2031. Now I know that's farther out, but that's you know 55 percent more than uh, than 10 years prior. So I mean, debt service really is increasing over the next few years. Okay. How do you guys anticipate dealing? So with you, that? I think. You 
got to read I, I would urge you to look at the Denapoli report closely. What it acknowledges is one, the the, M, the last several capital programs, the borrowing that goes that the debt where the debt service ends up on the operating budget has been flat. So there is no additional burden being placed on the operating budget. The additional borrowing has been lockbox, which is not ending up burdening the operating budget. Important distinction that especially, you know, the financial folks need to emphasize. Um, the, uh, and, and we are comparable into our, in our debt burden, as that report recognizes, to all, all the other major mass transit system. I think we're somewhere in the middle. So everybody has got uh, roughly the same burden. And the most important thing is that the, um, the controller basically said what we've been saying, which is we need to, we need Albany in the next year to come together, all the forces in Albany, all of our stakeholders to come together with a plan for how to address the MTA's fiscal cliff that's looming out there uh, a couple of years from now. So we're very much in alignment. Debt, debt service on the operating budget is flat. It's consistent with what's going on in other major transit systems. And there's really, uh, and, and the key point is his punchline, which is we need a plan from Albany. Straight in front of you, Juliet Papa from 1010 Wins Hi, Radio. You mentioned earlier in your remarks that um, you're selecting this, you're putting this panel together for a new strategy. And I'm getting the impression you're looking at, you know, behavior, permissiveness, and you said we're on the verge of an epidemic. To what end? What is your concern about that? You think there's just going to be a level of people who just walk through the turnstiles and that's it? Yeah, I, 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 I think you get it. I think what I'm concerned about is you know, a couple of things. One, I have to be concerned about making sure we have enough money to run this incredible system. We want to provide more service so people who are dependent on mass transit, who can't take an Uber, who don't have the money to own a car, we want to make sure that we can provide robust service for those people, for the New Yorkers who are dependent on transit. If we don't have revenue, that's going to be a problem in the long run. That's going to be a problem. Um, the other is what I said yesterday, which is I think that it, it is harmful to New York's sense of community that all of a sudden people who play by the rules uh, are looking at the folks next to them and see them not playing by the rules, and it feels like they're suckers to, if they pay. And then this starts to spiral out of control. It creates more, you know, rule breaking um, is not just a bad thing for its, for its own sake, but it said the sense of community and civic compact breaks down. I know that seems a little abstract, but that's how I feel as a New Yorker who's been living here and riding the rails and buses all my life is, you know, New Yorkers respect each other. And if we have an atmosphere where nobody plays by the rules and everybody feels like they're, they're suckers if they do, that's not good. So, so how do you change that behavior? How, how do you, how do you well, the, uh, the, what we propose, the panel that we propose is the opposite of a crackdown. What we're saying is let's come up with strategies that work that aren't just about more, more cops, more tickets. Let's deal with education as opposed to penalties and incarceration. Let's redesign the turnstiles. Let's redesign the exit gate because everybody knows that people are popping over the emergency exit gate and five, six, seven people just walk in. So look at design and education and affordability, investing more so fair evasion never has to be a crime of poverty, and also targeted enforcement where we can use strategic enforcement, even-handed, non-discriminatory, to keep criminals out of the system. If you could direct your attention to the mezzanine, please, where Henry Rossoff is waiting from PIX11. The only tickets I could afford. Thank you very much. Somewhat of a follow-up to uh, Juliet's question. Can you get a little bit more granular on the $500 million fare sure. shortfall? How much of that is we're not seeing, we're seeing people obscure their license plates coming across the rivers. We're seeing, we're talking a lot about people going through the exit door. How much is that? How much is people just not paying the LIRR? Can you get granular on that, please? Yeah, I don't have all the exact figures at my fingertips, but, you know, the, 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 toll, uh, the toll loss is real. It's something like in the $50 million range. Um, that's, that's, that is an outrage when people intentionally obscure their license plates or buy a fake license plate from some other state that, 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 that can't be traced to them 
to avoid paying the toll. That's really an outrage. Um, and um, I, I, we always talk about fare beating and fare evasion, and it always sounds like it's only a, a crime on transit. When you, when you intentionally avoid paying the toll that way, that's, a, that's wrong. That's wrong, and we should do something about that at the same time as we're talking about fare evasion in the subway, bus, and commuter rail system. So it's about 50 million to there, and it's, it's 200 something for both buses and subways. In the basically, we're emphasizing using current estimates, not final numbers, current estimates, current rates of fare evasion, and the commuter rail is an additional number. That's why I said in excess of 500 million. I, I will get to you some more specific numbers. Yeah, we have – there's a, a, a methodology that the MTA has used, which has been upgraded over time, to sample fare evasion at different stations in a consistent way so that you have a consistent – you know, it's not perfect science, but it's a, a, a sampling methodology. All right. On the Zoom machine, we've got Kevin Duggan of AM New York. Kevin, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for taking my question. Um, yeah, I just wanted a, a quick point of clarification on those numbers, John. I know you said that they'll send them afterwards. Is that just for the a prediction for this year? Yes. You're saying? Okay. Um, and so the, the Blue Rail Ribbon Panel, will it also look at uh, fare controls or fare evasion on the commuter railroads? I understand the rules seem to be a bit more uh, lenient there for people who don't have a fare right away. Is there going to be any change there? Absolutely. We will be looking at fare evasion on the commuter rails. Uh, and um, on better weekend service, uh, Dave of Streetspot already kind of touched on it. Like, what are some of the ideas floating around there to make weekend service better in the near term? Since, as you said, riders are returning there quicker than during the weekday. I, I, I mean, among other things, making sure you know part of this is paying overtime to uh, where necessary to make sure we have enough workforce um, on certain routes. If that has been a shortfall historically, um, coming out of COVID. Part of it is examining our, our scheduling of work. One of the goals of the capital program has been to make sure we were as efficient as possible when we did shutdowns of lines or routes that we were doing every bit of work necessary. So that has been very successful. But we need to take a, a, a look at what, if it's having disproportionate impacts to any particular service or line, uh, and, and we'll, be, we'll be looking at that. And then just basic issues of frequency. We have a great operations planning team, and we'll, we'll definitely uh, look at what, that, what they can uh, tell us about that. All right, up in the Riverview box, we've got Steve Burns from CBS 880 Radio. Steve. Hi, Jano. Um, a couple of quick questions for you. First, uh, on ridership, seeing the numbers plateau somewhat. I know that wasn't part of the original forecast. What do you think is behind that plateau, and how much more challenging does it get for these holdouts now that, that aren't coming back, you know, what, what's your method at this point? Well, the number one issue is the, the pace and frequency of return to work. I, there's no mystery here that w w everything we're seeing is that, m that private sector employers, especially in the central business district, have come back to uh, ask people to come back to work or they're having people come back to work at a slower pace than was projected by all kinds of industries and, and, uh, um, and prognosticators. So that's the principal issue. What I am concerned about is whether that process and that pace is being affected by the perception and reality of subway safety and the caliber of service. So we're going to focus on those things. I can't get in the heads of every uh, private sector company. We're, we're about subway safety and good service. That, that's our contributor to that equation. And that segues to my next question, which is this perception and reality question. I know they're kind of lumped together at the moment, but if perception no longer meets reality on safety, if folks are more worried than they should be at some point, does it become more difficult to acknowledge that moment, given how much of a concentration there is on the MTA saying things aren't safe right now? Steve, with all due respect, I'm not going to enter the matrix with you. Um, the perception, our job is to make the reality as strong as possible and to communicate effectively the appeal of transit. We will, you know, we're excited to, as you noted, know, remind people that, you know, traveling mass transit saves time, it saves money compared to, especially with the price of gas being what it is. Um, and, uh, and it gives you some time to do important things that you might not have 
the opportunity to do a browse for the day, catch up on your text, read a book, whatever. Um, we will be, we, we market mass transit and we'll be doing it, but the first issue is people feel like they're going to be safe and, uh, and, and, and have the reality that they will be safe. And moving on to David Meyer of the New York Post. David. Thank you. Um, Jano, first, um, hello. Uh, do you have evidence that fair beaters are more likely to commit crimes? Um, it's been a question asked to me in the last two days. I'm wondering if you have. I, 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 I can't tell you I have specific evidence of that. I would, I would say that all of the law enforcement professionals uh, suggest, you know, have always conveyed to us that um, when you're looking for, if, if you're looking for people with weapons or who intend to commit crimes, other rule breaking is an indicator of more probability. I, I don't have I don't have specific evidence of that. Got it. And um, on fares and buses in particular, yeah. Um, subway fare evasion is obviously at a dramatically high level right now. Bus fare evasion has been about twenty five percent for a couple of years going on. Mm -hmm. Now it's thirty percent. You just made a bus free. Um, not all your buses, but one one bus. I'm wondering if there's maybe a different approach to the fare problem on buses that might involve either making certain lines free or just, you know, it seems like the fare system on buses is much more broken down than on subways. I, I, Please think, address I think there's something to what you say. I think that we ha it has to be studied as its own condition or environment. You know, we, we're switching to Omni. The, the great thing about Omni, among others, is it gives you the opportunity to check who paid after the fact, right? And so we have to do that effectively, maybe with civilian fare checkers um, uh, rather than police. Um, but I, I do think, and, and this doesn't make me always popular in, inside this building, that we have muddied, that the, in fairness to the riders, the whole payment system for buses has become somewhat muddied because when we did the SBSs, people had to pay beforehand and have a receipt and then sometimes it was at the same stop where they were getting a local bus where they would swipe their Metro card. Then we did free buses and everybody got on the back. Uh, so uh, I do think it's a unique challenge in terms of rider behavior and has to be addressed on its own terms. You know, some of the ideas that you're putting out there uh, are meritorious. All right, next up is Morgan McKay right over here from Fox 5. Morgan. Thank you so much for taking my question. So Mayor Eric Adams yesterday said he was disappointed to see so many cops on platforms rather than patrolling the trains. He said he's been in conversations with you. Have you t spoken with him about this? And is there a certain am amount of time that cops have to spend on platforms rather than on trains? Or do they have to take the trains for a certain number of stops? I don't, I'm not sure what the mayor said that he didn't want them on platforms. I think he said he wants more cops on trains, which we very much support. He was talking, I think, more about cops who are hanging out on the mezzanine um, and, and other things. So I just want to make it clear, I support what Mayor Adams is saying and what he's doing. I think it's great that we have an ex-transit cop who has made subway safety a priority. And we're, we're working very closely with him, his police commissioner, Keith Chan Sewell, the chief of the Transit Police Bureau. Um, this is a team effort. And, and I'm really thrilled at the steps that have been taken, but there's more, there, there, there's, there's still a ways to go. Is there a certain route though? Like, do they have to stay on the train for like a certain number of stops or do they just sort of feel it out as they go? I, I, that, that's a deployment question that really is an NYPD question you should put to them. All I can tell you is I saw cops on my train in, you know, fairly far into Brooklyn, which I hadn't seen in many years recently. So. That is a difference that I've experienced personally. And we go to Clayton Gooser right here from the Daily News. Hi, how are you, Jen? Um, <clears throat> first, I have two things I wanted to ask him. First, on toll evaders, you say you just said it's a $50 million problem. Obviously, um, could be a much bigger problem once congestion pricing launches. Um, so the first part of this question is, um, in the budget, in the governor's budget proposal to crack down on toll evaders, never made it through. Is that something you're pushing for in the yes. legislati le legislative session? And two, what are you doing from a policing end? Because obscured people with obscured license plates, um, I, I can't tell you how many stories I've written about people who hit and run children and kill them when they have an obscured license plate. Uh, there is a history of um, running guns and other illicit materials over your bridges and tunnels. Um, with people trying to evade the tolls. So what are you doing from the policing end, and then what are you doing from the legislative end on this? Is, and I can, is Danny I got another here thing. to help us? Danny? Thank you. Uh, 
so I think we all agree, based on what Mayor Adams said recently, that it, the covered of the plates so of people driving around with a forged instrument or a fake plate is a regional issue. It's not specific to tolling, but it does impact tolls. And working with our state and city partners in this, uh, we've been looking at it at, from a law enforcement perspective since the, the beginning of cashless tolling in, back in 2017. We've written over 36,000 summonses with the help of the state police on bridges and tunnels for covered and obstructed plates. And this year alone, it's over 500 summonses. And you're going to see very soon, which actually started, it's going to start May 1st, but we actually started the initiative. We're going to be working with uh, NYPD, state police, Port Authority police, the sheriff's office, so if you're going over a bridge or tunnel over Port Authority, you're going over a bridge or tunnel at bridges, our bridges and tunnels, so you're parked on the street where the sheriff's office can get you, you're driving in city streets, NYPD is looking for it. This is something that's a regional issue. And, um, and again, I applaud this uh, panel to bring awareness to this and also Mayor Adams for bringing awareness on the city side. And it's going to be a collective effort as we go after people that cover their plates. And a piece of that that I like to thank the chair on talking about education on toll evasion and, and fare evasion is to teach people not to cover their plate. Some people think that a clear plastic over a plate is legal. It's not legal. Some people think if they buy a license plate on Amazon for 50 bucks that says Jersey Girl, they could put it right on their, they could put it right on their vehicle, and that's illegal. So these are the things that we're looking for, and we have people on the facilities and we're, we're doing things based on observation. I don't want to give away all our secrets, but it's definitely something that's a, a high awareness at the facilities. The, the, the overall percentage of people that uh, cover their plates is less than 1% on our facilities when you think about 308 million vehicles that come over our facilities. So that's, that's the percentage for the people that cover their plates. Okay, thank you. Um, Unless you wanted to hit on the legislative thing, I got another question. Yeah, I mean, we, we think it's time to up the enforcement at, at, at and, and we've asked the legislature to do, to, uh, to, to take action on the proposal that's been pending there for some time. Okay. Um, while There's we're still time in this session. This is where the budget's over. Now is the time to deal with this kind of issue and, and we're going to continue to advocate for it. Okay. While we're on the legislature, I wanted to follow up on Michelle's question, just um, you guys have a fiscal cliff coming. I'm, uh, your predecessor, Pat Foy, called for dedicated, new dedicated streams of revenue for the MTA. His predecessor, Joe Loda, called for new dedicated streams of revenue for the MTA. You have pointed to a fiscal cliff. You said you're okay this year, but I'm just confused as to where is the urgency? Um, Governor Hochul has gone around the state giving out uh, candy to drivers in Buffalo, but, but nothing to you guys by way of dedicated well, revenue. So where is the urgency okay, so as we face this well, fiscal so in, cliff? Since it seems to me like you need me to say the magic word, I am for a solution to the fiscal cliff that includes recurring revenue for the MTA and consistent with the, the MTA position for, you know, since time immemorial, we're not going to direct or, or push any particular solution. We're going to do what I've been doing exactly, which is to let the legislature know that that issue has to be dealt with or else the MTA board, which is obligated statutorily to balance, balance the budget, only has tools that none of us want to use. Fare hikes, service reductions, layoffs. None of that is appealing. None of that is good for our city, our, our, the region's recovery. We are urging the legislature to take action. Now, in fairness, um, I, I did not expect that that issue would be resolved in this legislative session because we are in the process of figuring out what the trajectory of return to work and the economic position of the MTA coming out of the pandemic is. Um, and thanks to Washington, Chuck Schumer, and others, we are, um, our, our deficits are covered for a couple of years, but we are very much hoping and expecting that action will happen in the next legislature. Just to be clear with riders, if that funding doesn't come, can you paint a picture of how bad it could look? It's premature for me to do that, but $2 billion is a lot of service and a lot of personnel and a lot of fares. So um, I'm, it's premature for me to start talking about scenarios because that we're not at that point. Um, I've had good conversations with the governor and other stakeholders in Albany. Just want to be clear, action needs to be taken, and it really needs everyone needs to start thinking about what are those strategies and options, um, not wait until, you know, 
next, sometime next year. We need to start thinking about those soon. All right, as we wind down, we're going to go to Zoom to a man who literally posted odds on Twitter on what you and the governor would be saying earlier today. Not sure how he got it right, but Ben no. Kaback of Second Avenue Soccer. Ben, ben Kaback, then he retweeted Dave. That was, that was Dave. I have to give Dave credit. That was his idea. Dave Colon was making book. And Ben apparently was placing the bets. Ben and Jose uh, and Jose got an award. So does everybody say exactly, happy? exactly. So two omni-related questions vis-a-vis um, -vis fair evasion. What's the status of uh, rear door bus boarding, and, and how would that potentially help cut down on fair evasion? We we want to do rear door bus boarding. It doesn't right now. I, I I've said this to uh, lots of our stakeholders. We're big supporters of all door bus boarding, but it doesn't. It doesn't seem fair until we have everybody, even if they're not yet on Omni, can participate in that. So um, I, I said to folks, to be honest, I want to wait until we're further into the Omni adaptation um, and transition to really move forward rear door bus boarding, because especially since I think we only have somewhere between 10 and 15 percent Omni penetration on the buses. It wouldn't, it wouldn't really be fair to, to try to manage rear, rear door bus boarding and limit it to Omni customers. All right, great. And the second one, I know the MTA is amidst spending over $700 million on the Omni rollout, and you mentioned redesigning fare control. Was there any consideration to redesigning fare control as part of the Omni rollout, and how complicated can that be? Because it seems to me that turnstiles that aren't easy to jump and emergency exits that aren't so easy to prop open would be part of this comprehensive solution the Blue Ribbon Panel is tasked with coming up with. But it seems that we're sort of on different tracks and different processes here. No, Ben, I think, I think, I think the, you made a, a, a good point. Those two things ought to intersect. Um, we do have a lot of people working on that Omni transition. We are on the verge of a new fair uh, design, I mean, fair array design. Um, the, the thing that obviously is that the, the, the Omni team did not have to take into consideration was these incredibly porous emergency gates, which are fire code compliance driven, and we need to figure out how to comply with the fire code without having a door that people just push open and, and, and becomes, you know, a, a porous entry into the system. So. Um, but but I think that your, your your point is well taken, which is the design that's being done for Omni and the design that will be thought through, uh, adjustments that will be thought through by the Blue Ribbon Panel intersect. All right, and now to the man who odds are will not make his 215 reservation at the Don Pepe Deli this afternoon, the conductor himself, Jose Martinez of the can, city. Jose. Everybody gets a nickname now. Uh, hi, Jano. Um, Obviously, the governor was here, and it's clear where she stands in, in terms of her relationship with the MTA. But how would you describe uh, your relationship, or the, or rather, the authorities, with Mayor Adams in terms of not only policing but all matters MTA, in comparison with his predecessor, Bill De Blasio? I, I would just—I'm not going to characterize the past. Um, I'm, I'm just going to refer you to, like, the mayor has been incredibly supportive of the MTA generally and of our, um, and our partnership on safety and security issues. Um, he said some nice things about me personally, um, but that's less important than what he's saying about the, uh, about the MTA and our partnership institutionally and how important it is to him personally that we have a safe subway system as part of his broader strategy for the city uh, and, and, and for our economy. And beyond the subway and safety, what are other things that the city's collaboration or partnership could I, I mean, the mayor has been a leader on, uh, he, he stepped up to create a, a very ambitious vision of how, we, how, how much more we do on bus lanes and bus camera enforcement. That's the area where operationally the city and the MTA intersect the most. And it's a, a hugely important for all of our goals for, 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 for equity, because the buses are the engine. I always say the engine of equity because they serve so many people in neighborhoods that don't have a lot of subway service and in low-income neighborhoods. Um, and uh, because they are so dependent on 
the conditions at the street level. So that's a huge area where we're working together. It's transformational if that partnership can deliver. All right, wrapping it up today with us is Michael Gold of The New York Times. Michael. Hello, I've got 30 questions on cameras now. Uh, uh, the governor was here today, and I want to ask about masks. Uh, mask enforcement on the subway from the MTA's own data compliance has been very low. It's decreased incredibly steadily since the mayor lifted uh, many of the masking uh, requirements in the city. And obviously, there's a CDC and federal government court case that's still happening, but I'm wondering to what extent you've spoken with the governor about whether it makes sense to lift a mask mandate as it applies to the MTA, and to what extent you think a mask mandate might encourage or deter ridership as you guys try to get more people on the trains. So uh, I, I'm not certain what uh, the answer to the last question. I really don't, I'm not certain whether it encourages or deters ridership. There are strong feelings on both sides. It's no secret. Um, the what I'd say about the, the mask mandate is it is right now the New York State Department of Health and we, you know, coming out of the pandemic, the one thing that I think many of us have learned is we're not arguing the people who are professional scientists. It's not our job. The New York State Department of Health has said they include public transit in the categories of spaces that are subject to masking. I am sympathetic. One, I disagree with you only in one thing, Michael, which is I don't think there's a low level of compliance. Compliance has gone down, to be sure. But if you ride the subway or the bus in the morning, as, as many of us do, the compliance is high, very high. So people are, I think, mostly complying. Compliance level definitely has eroded somewhat because people are going to so many other places where masking is not expected of them. So it's definitely a little bit confusing. It's especially confusing in places like Penn Station where there are multiple operations with slightly different rules. Um, but I think New Yorkers, by and large, are complying. New Yorkers look out for each other. Um, so it, it is not huge drama on our mass transit system. There are other issues which are, I think, more important to New Yorkers right now as they use mass transit and resume coming to work. And then speaking of some of those other issues, uh, the mayor has voiced his support for exploring weapons detect detection systems as it pertains to the subway, but obviously he would need cooperation from the MTA to do that. And I'm wondering to what extent you guys are involved in those discussions and the, and the research process. Yeah, there. I mean, what, we, what I said is, like, I'm thrilled that the, the mayor is a, a huge uh, technology enthusiast. And I, I, I welcome that because that's one of the ways that we can address many of our issues in the city and potentially the subway system and the mass transit system as well. Omni is transformational. We're in that technology transformation business as well. Um, uh, some of the biggest innovations in, you know, our life in New York have been things like EasyPass and MetroCard and now Omni. So those are really important. So we're going to work with the mayor on all of these technology concepts. We have not gotten deep into them yet, but there is there is a place in the discussion for anything that could make, this, you know, any technology idea that could potentially make the system safer. We're definitely in partnership on those issues. All right. Thanks, Jano. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, everybody. Good afternoon from Lower Manhattan.